I'm your host, Bradley Martin, and this is Clearing the Way, a resource for small business owners. Hello, humans. I'm your host, Bradley Martin, and this is Clearing the Way, a resource for small business. Uh, I talk with sales and HR experts, other small business owners, and anyone else that can provide you with information to clear your way to success. Uh, my guest today is Andrew uh, Gradert or Gra- Gradert. Gradert, uh, co-founder of Maestro Sauce Company. Uh, Andrew graduated from West Liberty University with a bachelor's in business administration and computer information systems. Uh, he received his MBA from Waynesburg University in 2012. Andrew began working at PPG as an IT security analyst in 2010. Uh, He moved on to become a senior auditor and analytics lead before starting his current role uh, as global data governance manager. Uh, In 2019, Maestro's Sauce Company was founded. Uh, Maestro's takes pride in their ability to create sauces that satisfy the craving for both heat and flavor. Uh, As of September 20th, that is today, um, Andrew sits in 15th place out of 49, six spots ahead of me in the North Surveying Disc Golf Handicap (laughs) League. Uh, Andrew, thank you for being a guest on Clearing the Way. Um, So let's uh, let's kind of start – let's start – uh, back. Let's start back in school. Um, how, as a as a kid, um, well, first, everything good there? Did yep, I miss yeah, anything? No, you're good. Miss anything? Yep, okay, yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so, as a kid, any any sports? What kind of student were you? Like, let's kind of start from the beginning. So, uh, yeah, I was a good student. I loved school. I was a nerd. Um, actually, loved school. Loved uh, English okay. and writing and reading. Not so good at math. How did you math. end up in – okay, we'll get there. It, but weird. like, it's Okay. It's a journey. Um, and then I played baseball, and uh, my dad really liked that, and so I wanted to do that for him, and, and I found out I hated it. Okay. So, <laughs> how, how early did you realize I that? I played until Bron- – I played through Bronco. Okay. So what is that, like thir- 12, 13, I yeah. think? Yeah. We won um, a little bit bunch of championships. Before. Like, we were a really good team. I wasn't good. They were good. Okay. Um, and then – Got into, I'm a band geek, got into band and started doing what that. What did you play? Anything brass. So okay. I started on trumpet, That's moved cool. to baritone, trombone, euphonium, tuba, bass trombone. Okay. So I learned all those and um, just kept picking it up and going and toyed around with a couple other instruments and um, really enjoyed it. Just loved music. And then once I got out of high school, I stopped playing. Um, okay. I really haven't touched anything since. Um, still love to listen to music, but I just don't play it anymore. Um, it wasn't that big of a passion for me. It was just yeah. it was a fun thing to do during school. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, played a lot of card games. So I played Pokemon okay. growing up. I played and still play Magic the Gathering. Okay. Um, big fan of that. I've been playing that for oh God, 25 years. <laughs> okay. Okay. <sighs> it hurts my soul to say those numbers. <laughs> um, made a lot of – I mean, honestly, I've, I've made – some of the best lifelong friends I've had through that. Um, okay. I'm still friends with a lot of my friends from high school. Were you – is that something like – I don't know enough about any of the. Oh, I know about Pokemon, but like, yeah. I, is that something that there were like meetups for that you would have to go to? Like, how does there, that how does that work? There are tournaments, okay. um, and I actually play right across the street from here, so over okay. at the gaming dungeon, yeah, yeah, yeah. right here in Washington. Um, played there for a long time. Played casually with friends, and um, got into the started playing competitively a little bit. Went to bigger tournaments, what they call Grand Prix, um, over the last probably 10 years, travel at upwards of five hours, only do like one or two a year. Okay. Uh, I wasn't going that deep down the competitive route where it became my life. Um, but it was it was a really cool resource. So as I said, I was really good at English and writing and, and reading. Um, I was not good at math. That game is built around math. And so I started playing huh. it like probably seventh, sixth, seventh grade. My uncle got me into it. And... Played it very casually with him. And then in ninth grade, I actually started playing with friends in school, started buying my own cards, building my own decks. And um, it teaches a lot of really valuable life skills. And so I'm trying to get my six-year-old to play it. What like like what are some examples? Resource management, time management, social interactions, uh, critical thinking, hmm. uh, critical reading. Um, additional, like just basic math. You have your addition, subtraction. Uh-huh. You have exponential math. You have huh. divisive gra- math. Um, so you're doing a lot of division, multiplication, exponentials, um, just, uh, understanding how timing and rules work. Uh, the rule book is like a thousand pages long. Oh, no joke. Okay. It's growing okay. all the time. So knowing all those different interactions, um, I actually became, uh, 
a rules advisor so I could go to a tournament and I could be a, essentially a judge um, for the lower levels. And you could, I could have gone through and became a higher level judge. I would have taken the test, but I decided not to because huh. uh, it was just too much time. And I wasn't putting it to enough use. It was good for yeah. friends, getting people together and understanding how this works with that because there's, I don't know, 50,000 cards and they all interact differently with each other. <laughs> so Jesus. it teaches a lot of a lot of really cool skills that um, – have really they they have impacted me more. Honest to God, they've impacted me more than college and, and graduate school did. That is wild. So that they've is been, definitely something that you don't really think about. With it's been less theory and more practice, and that's where it kind of came into play. And that's why I wanted my daughter. My daughter loves math. She's very good at math. I don't know where she got it from, but she's good at it. And. She's not so good at the reading and that part. Uh -huh. she, she's not putting as much effort to that. She does what she really enjoys. Yeah. And so there was a tournament in Pittsburgh, and I took her up there just for her, and I'd sit down and play. And I've never seen her so engaged with huh. being in somewhere like that. Outside yeah. of she's a dance. Um, That's cool. It's a, it's a really um, – it's a fun game. It's – uh, you learn a lot, and it takes a lot of thought process to get through from point A to point B. And I basically build, like, these puzzle box-style things. So it's not just I'm going from point A to point B. I'm going from A to B to C to D to E to F to G, yeah. and there's backup plans for everything. So, like, if you take away one of my elements, I can pivot and do something uh -huh. different. Um, huh. And so I try to work through that. And it's that, that has honestly helped me so much in my professional life. Really? Because of the fact that... Nothing ever goes according to plan, ever, ever, right? You can – the best laid plans always find issues. How quickly did you realize that there were – like, is this a reflection thing that you've realized that it – It took a few years. Okay. Um, but but, it's been but early on, you yeah. noticed it. I okay. noticed I, – So, um, like, as a – I mean, you would have been in, like, high school. Right. You noticed, when I was in high school, I noticed my math grades starting to increase. They started going up. Um, it became a little bit easier to understand how these different pieces work together, and it's hmm. – it's a uh, – use the term LIFO, right, last in, first out, is that's a, the same type of metric that they use in the game. So when we started doing stuff for uh, – proofs for geometry and stuff like that became very simplistic. Like I found those to be very, very easy tasks huh. where other people were struggling with them. And it was more of the um, – the, the, the abstract thinking – that I wasn't so good at. Yeah. Um, so it's abstract style maths, like, a, you know, calculus. I'm not good at calculus. So I'm not good at trigonometry, right? But, like, I can handle the basic stuff. Hmm. Okay. That's, okay. It's, it's crazy. Um, well, and it's also weird that, I mean, I guess if your grades are improving, you did did you attribute it to that at the beginning? Or was it kind of like, it, what the I hell's happening? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't attribute it right away. <laughs> okay. Um, but then I started realizing, like, I'm doing a lot more complex math in a short time frame yeah. than what I ever was. Like, I was... Practicing math without yeah. practicing math, right? Yeah. There, there's this whole thing that's happening with businesses now where they gamify everything, yeah. right? Because they, they get more engagement and it yeah. really trains their employees. And so I gamified math, yeah. right? And it was yeah. like, okay, this is this is really crazy. Huh. But Damn, it, was okay. a, it was such a cool experience. So like, now that I look back on it, right, I start seeing all these other facets of my life that it's touched regarding time management and resource management and understanding like when you've been beaten – and you, you realize you're you have nothing left to give. Yeah. Like just time to withdraw and, and figure something else out. But Huh. Okay. Damn, okay. So through high school, when you're so you're done with that, what did you did you know what you were gonna do? Did you have any so, clue what was going also, on? Okay. Um I went to school at uh West Lip, or uh, I went to Wayne or Wheeling Jesuit first. Okay. Sorry. Uh spent about a year and a half there. Um, didn't do well, didn't do well, uh, ended up losing the scholarship that I had, was not making great grades, was basically, basically focusing on anything else but school. Okay. Just wasn't interested. And I went for political science and pre-law. I wanted to be a lawyer and okay. I wanted to eventually what, become a judge. Where did that come from? Uh, the reading comprehension piece. And I thought it'd be a good way to make money. And, you know, and then I realized number one, I suck at lying. <laughs> and so I couldn't be a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and number two, I was bored out of my skull. Because okay, it was the same thing all the time. So when I was in my poli sci classes and I wasn't opening my books, even from their cellophane wrapping, I was getting like 99% in the class. I was doing really well in those classes. It was the other classes that 
<laughs> I was just kind of like, yeah, I don't really care. Yeah. And I, I really had an issue when my, my turning point when I basically said, I'm done with this school, I'm going to go somewhere else and do something different, was I had a history teacher that told me that my writing was terrible. And meanwhile, my English professors, my writing professors are like, no, your, English, your writing is fantastic. So I'm like, I had one professor that literally basically flunked me because she didn't like how I wrote. I'm like, but it's systematically correct. Like, this is how you're supposed to write by the rules of how you're supposed to write. So I ended up leaving and went to West Liberty, decided to go. I was, I, I had like a, a moment of what, who am I? What yeah. do I want to do? And I realized like, okay, at this point I had started playing. I, I had been playing World of Warcraft for a few years. Um, I had built my own computers and built, you know, different computers for other people. Yeah. And really enjoyed the technology side of it and constantly learning from it. Something my uncle and I had always done was we did a lot of stuff with technology. So I'm like, okay, like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And so I switched my major, switched schools. And next thing you know, my grades are up through the roof. Um, I ended up graduating with like a overall like a 3.7 GPA or something like that. Um, from where I was. And I think I was at like a, a 2.6 or something like that when <laughs> okay. I left Wheeling Jesuit. Okay. And we're talking like, I was always like a 3.6, a 4.0 student yeah. for my entire life. So when I kind of flunked out almost, it was a, it was bad. Like yeah. I didn't know what to do because I'd never been like that. And I was, I was not interested at all. Um, I knew that I didn't want to work at Wendy's for the rest of my life. So, um, ended up going to school and, um, when I went to graduate was the downturn of the economy. Um, okay, that's a problem. So I couldn't even get an internship that was unpaid because they had freezes on everything. So I couldn't get work study at school because they went off of, you know, how much parents made. And uh -huh. my parents, even though they weren't paying for my student loans, because one thing my parents said, like, hey, we paid for the first time. Yeah. Or we were, we were taking part of your debt. We're not taking any of your debt now. It's all on you. Yeah. Which was a great lesson, right? You know, and some, some people are like, oh, my parents don't, they suck. I'm like, no, my, I needed that because yeah. – I became accountable for me. Yeah. Um, and the onus was on me to do well. So um, couldn't find a job and ended up going back to work at Wendy's. I worked at a golf course cutting greens and grass, which I absolutely hated. Worst shop I've ever had. <laughs> um, and then I f was working at another restaurant here and there. And I, I finally just I landed a job at PPG through a friend. We met up and he's like, hey, give me your resume. He's like, I'll send it over. And then next thing you know, interviews started coming. And so I got hired. Okay. That's wild. Um, okay. So when you you went back for your MBA, mm -hmm. why did you do – like what, what happened there? Why so did you do that? How did that come about? I was um, – I was out of college and couldn't find a job and because of the, the downturn, yeah. right? So, I mean, I was applying – all over the place, going through some interviews and not getting them because I didn't have the experience. You know, somebody yeah. worked at work study at school, so they got a job over yeah. me in one instance, right? And I'm like, well, it's not really my fault. I couldn't do anything about that. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know what? Screw it. If I have free time, I might as well put it to use and further myself more. So um, went, went to Waynesburg, applied, had to actually have multiple conversations with them because I was the youngest person that had applied to go for my MBA at that point in time. So I had to have different letters of recommendation from people. I had to go talk to former professors at college to get letters from them saying Wait that they second. thought I was capable of handling the workload. This was after you had already graduated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was uh, – I would have been 21 years old at that point. Okay. Well, okay. 22. Um, Isn't that normal? I, I, now it is. I guess then, it, like for their program, it wasn't. They were. It was a lot. What and the honestly, hell? I was. I was one of the I'm very young. Right. Like most of the people were, you know, five, six, seven years older than me. They had gone back to school. Okay. Um, That's so weird. Then yeah. So it was. Okay. Um, and it was. A, it was a. That was so a, why did you choose to do that? Like it's still. So you were doing. Um, Information, yeah. Computer I was a, yeah, I was a, a cybersecurity analyst. I was so, an IT security analyst. Where did they, like, what did you think, what was the plan with that? Like, why did you choose to go back for that? So I was already in my grad school before I started my job at PPG. Okay. So it was it was more to... Just get another do thing on your... something more to progress okay. my career further. Okay. Um, and then 
I became, I got the job as, as an IT analyst. And it was, it was really, really weird. So I was already a year into my studies by the time I got this job. And I was in the middle of, I was taking two, they, they wanted to limit me to only one class a, at a time. And I was like, no, I want to do two or three. I can handle this. This isn't a big deal. And so I remember we, I forget which class it actually was, um, but we were coming up on our final and I was getting married and I was starting a new job. So I started my job at PPG three days after I got married. So I got married, moved, okay. and started a new job in three days. Okay, that's okay. a lot. It's a, it's a lot. Plus was doing school and my job. Um, and so we had this final. My teacher was actually very worried about me um, because she'd never seen somebody take on so much in such a short amount of time, especially being so young. Uh-huh. And uh, I ended up getting 100% on the final. Okay. And I was the only one to get 100% on the final. And I was like, well, this is easy. Like, what are you talking about? This was no big deal. <laughs> okay. um, and honestly, I think I think grad school was easier than undergrad was. Um, I enjoyed a lot more. I had a lot more freedom. Uh, and it was more more critical thinking skills than it was hard and fast regurgitating information back, right? Yeah. You could literally have a debate with your professor and ask better questions. And they were able to answer you more. Yeah. Because um, you were – paying a lot more money to do this. It wasn't just, yeah. oh, I need to get my yeah. first piece of paper, right? Yeah, Saying I graduated yeah. from college to get a job. Yeah. Um, you were taking on extra work to be here. Yeah. So I, I did enjoy it more. Um, how much of it I actually use on a day-to-day basis. That, that was the part of the MBA too, is you were, like you said, you know, people with MBAs make typically double their salary. Um, and they make, you know, 0.5 times more than somebody with just a master's degree and a focus. Um, and so you're, you're, you become this jack of all trades and a master of none, yeah. which I wanted to do because it left me uh, broad Gave horizons, you, yeah. right? Like I could do yeah. a bunch of different things. And that has helped me out. That piece, that type of mentality has helped me out so much in my normal career um, because nothing I've done leads to the – it yeah. does in some ways, but they've yeah. been very different roles. When you So when you got the job at PPG originally – were you trying? I mean, at that point, were you just trying to get a job, or did you to get want to a job? I wanted specifically to within IT. okay. Um, so within the IT realm, I was trying to get a job, and I had applied a couple other places, and um, so PPG came up to me and they said, you know, I had two different interviews. I didn't even realize it was two different interviews. It was, they had multiple people in the room, and they were from different teams, um, and so I thought I was applying for the service desk. Well, the service desk said, uh, we think your skills lie better elsewhere, and it was IT security that said we think your skills are phenomenal for what we have, right? You can pay attention to procedures. You can mm-hmm. follow documentation. You have critical thinking skills. You have good soft skills. You can communicate with people. Um, and so that's when I got the job at IT security. And the funny part was they were like, you know, how much experience do you have with Active Directory? I was like, I had one class for one hour total ever throughout my school. And that became my day-to-day job. And that's when I realized that job descriptions – can be completely bogus mm-hmm. and past past experience also is bogus if you have somebody that's willing to do the work if yeah they're willing to put it in and they're interested then that's more important than somebody especially entry level than somebody who went to school to do it i yes if you've got good leadership if you have good leadership because if which, not then you've just got somebody who's doesn't know how to do a job that you're not right. telling them how to do and we we <laughs> had we had great documentation it's very ground level um you know they, they, I could hand it to you who's never done the work before and you could follow that procedure. Okay. Um, that and that, that's how we built it. Right. Yeah. And that was, I, it was amazing coming into something like that. And then as I moved through different teams and different roles within PPG, that's not always the case. There's a lot of tribal knowledge that you have to fight through, right? Like, oh, you have to go talk to, you know, Joe over there because he knows what he's talking about. Well, Bob knows this other piece. You have yeah. to talk to him too. Yeah. And then neither one of them really has time to talk to you, nor do they, you know, honestly care it most of the time. Yeah. And maybe they're not the best at explaining it, right? Because they they know it, they don't have to explain it. Yeah. So you've got good leadership there. You didn't. You weren't really qualified for the job. You had a degree in they, something somewhat similar. They were looking for somebody with IT like IT focused background, mm-hmm. like with a degree in IT, but that was willing to come in and learn. Because the thing is, you know, you, you I, I've been through enough of this where they want. You want somebody with A, A, B, C credentials or criteria. But if you – just because I do something one way 
doesn't mean your company does it the same way. Yeah. Right? Like, um, there's a lot of, it's why you have good training. You have good documentation. You have to teach somebody how to be part of your company. Yeah. Um, because of the fact that they might do it differently. And you also have to be willing to listen to what they say because yeah. what they're doing might be better. And I've been very fortunate with my career at PPG that, you know, outside of a few specific circumstances that my bosses and my coworkers listen to what I have to say and they value my opinion and my thoughts. Um, and whether they're right or wrong, right, at least it opens up discussion. It's never just been, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And yeah. just kind of, sh- you know, shove you out of the room. Okay. So before, I'm gonna, I mean, I kind of want to miss this earlier, but you, it kind of came up. Your were your parents encouraging you to go down any particular path? Like, where did they? Okay, nope, so just they were like, just uh, find what makes you happy, as long as it's not something stupid. Okay, um, okay. Like, you that better be able to find fair. a job at it. Yeah. Right. Like, um, don't don't go do something that you know, you know. You better be able to make money at this. Yeah. Right. Like, I have a. I, there's so many people that I've known that have gone through college and they got some. They got a degree, yeah. But it's basically a bogus degree. That yeah. w- what are they going to do with it? Yeah. Right. There's it's a maybe yeah. half a dozen of these in the world that you know yeah. people have jobs for, and yeah, yeah. And you're one of a ton of people that have exactly. A degree. And that's the thing is you know if you're going to you know go be a you know history major, you better find a job in something relating to history, right? Yeah. You're either be a teacher Professor, or yeah. you know you better be able to find something. Yeah. And that was my parents' thing. That was the only thing is do something that you think, number one, you're going to enjoy doing, and number two, that you can find a job at. Okay. Um, Okay. And they've been, I mean, with everything that I've done, it's always been very supportive. Um, Outside of when I screwed up, that was not, that was a lot of, there was a bad time, right? Yeah, yeah. Did, are either of them, so at any point was starting or owning a business in the, like, had that ever been something that even interest you, yeah, interested I, you? I always thought that I could do it, and I've okay. always thought that I'd be good at doing it. I didn't know what I want to do. Hot sauce was <laughs> not it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, if you yeah. would have asked me 10 years ago, would you own a hot sauce? And they'd be like, no, yeah. there's no way, yeah. right? I wasn't even interested in hot sauce 10 years ago. I wasn't interested <laughs> okay, in spicy okay. food 10 years ago. Okay. Like, it's been, that's been the wild ride, and that's been the kind of the thing that my parents are like, like they're they're super supportive, mm-hmm. but it's been. Are either of them? Did either of them? Nope. Okay. They are. They're they're plain Jane, like no spices. Okay. So. Well, I, th- but business, like no. Okay. Okay. No. So um, that is you. You thought you could do it. They both went through trade school. Uh, my dad's a welder by trade. He drives. Uh, he's drive. He's driven. You know, semi tractor trailers for my my entire life growing up. Okay. And my mom went to. She she's a receptionist at. Uh, Dental offices. Huh. Um, that's pretty much what she's done most of the time. She's worked for some doctors and some other stuff, but she's really just been a, you know, she's she does a receptionist job. Okay. Um, which she loves, you know, and yeah. she gets to interact with people and he loves, you know, he's enjoys his job, but neither one of them were business owners or, you know, they Did, didn't go to like college, college. I was the first one to do it out of the family. Okay. Did, we're jumping ahead a little bit here, yeah. but I'm good with it. If it, when you, guys were starting maestros i guess it's a little bit different because it wasn't your it's not the main thing no what were their thoughts when that when you were starting that my parents thoughts? yeah yeah uh they thought it was really cool okay um they were like never would have saw that coming but it's cool and you know whatever they can do to support they've done i mean they take sauces into their offices. We have <laughs> repeat orders coming from their their entire area. Like my dad's call, constantly calling up, "Hey, I need, you know, yeah. three of these, three of these, three of these. Bring them by. You know, mom will stop by later and grab them on her way home from work." And okay. my mom's office is the same way. And then Christmas gifts, and you know, they they pedal it honestly just as hard as I do most <laughs> okay. of the time. So. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So so you keep moving up in um, at PPG, right? Um, and then you guys decide you're going to start a sauce company. Yep. How the hell did that happen? Uh, and this was, what, like 2019, 2019 I got here. Yeah. So, so um, I had been out of IT security for a little bit, and I met Ross, who's one of the co- other co-owners. You've worked at PPG the whole, t- the whole okay. time. Okay. Yeah. So Ross came in. He worked on IT security with me. We overlapped for a very short amount of time in the role we did, but... We knew each other, right? We were on the same team for, I don't know, a couple months. And um, 
we were riding the train the one day and he stopped me. And he was like, hey, he's like, I, you know, I know you. Can I sit with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we started just BSing and it became a thing that we did every day. And the one day he goes, do you like spicy stuff? And at this point, I'm like, yeah, I do. Uh, so funny story about that one. Hated spicy things. Got my gallbladder out. Love spicy things. Doesn't affect me. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Like, All right. The heat, the heat still gets me, but like yeah. don't have stomach issues when I eat spicy stuff. I yeah. used to. So, and I've talked to a couple of people about that too, because typically as you get older, spicy affects you worse. I'm actually tolerating it better than I used to when I was younger. Okay. That's nice. So, but he, um, I was like, you know, I was like, yeah, I, it's okay. You know, I'm thinking, you know, Frank's, Tabasco, uh-huh. Sriracha, whatever. And I'm like, you know, I, they, I have some of each of those and I use them intermittently. Yeah. Like, uh, they're okay. They just don't taste like a whole lot. Yeah. Right? And he goes, no, no, no. There's like a, a whole world of artisanal hot sauces out there. And he's like, have you ever heard of Hot Ones? And Hot Ones was very, like, we're talking like season one, season uh-huh. two. Okay. And so he starts bringing, he's like, I'm going to bring in sauces tomorrow. Okay, cool. <laughs> so he brought in uh, literally a lunchbox of like, 20 different sauces, and I tried all of them. Some of them absolutely wrecked me. They were super hot. There were a few that I'm like, man, this was really flavorful. This was really good. It wasn't just hot, and I, I yeah. fell in love with that kind of aspect of it. So we started bonding over this, became friends over it. And the other two owners at the time, uh, when we founded this, I worked with Dennis at Wendy's for, oh God, since I was in middle school, right? Um, since I could get a job. And Justin and I have been best friends since third grade. Okay. okay. So it was this um, – Ross and I had bonded over this. And so Ross came to me and said, hey, I'm going to make a hot sauce. And I'm like, how do you know how to do this? Like, oh, there's a YouTube video on how to make a hot sauce, yeah. right? It's from yeah. one of the companies that we watch, and they did it with Heat Mist from Hot Ones. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, I'll watch it. And I'm sitting I'm like, well, if he's going to make a hot sauce, I'm going to make a hot yeah. sauce, right? Like, yeah. I can do yeah. that. Yeah. And so he made this serrano sauce. It was very basic and it was good, right? And I made some, I went way off kilter and I made this cranberry ginger habanero sauce, that sounds which was killer on thanks. I made it Thanksgiving. That sounds so I took it to fantastic. dinner with me and it was on you know on it became a cranberry sauce, uh-huh. right? And so then I was like, oh man, my wife and I had just gone to Jamaica for a friend's wedding, and I had had curry goat when I was there, and I fell in love. And so I bought curry seasoning and I brought it home and I was making chicken rub out of it. So my daughter and I were, we went on this phase where we were in chicken thighs and I was grilling, I was, you know, grilling them mm-hmm. and I was making this rub with curry and mustard and some ginger and some garlic and it was delicious. And so I'm like, well, this sauce came out really well, but I bet I can turn this one into a hot sauce too. And then I was like, well, it has a bowl flavor. Curry's strong. Yeah. Got to have heat. Something in habaneros. And so I went and bought everything made a batch, and took it to work. Now, meanwhile, PPG is in, in downtown office. There's, you know, 500 people that yeah. work there or whatever, maybe more. And I'm friends with most of them. So I took it over, and people started trying. They're like, man, this is really good. How much <laughs> for a bottle? I'm like, I can't sell it. Like, I'm not licensed for anything, so yeah, yeah. Like, you can taste it. Yeah. Um, and so Ross came over, and he was like, man, this is this is pretty good. And then he came over again later, and he's like, I need some more of that. He came over again. He's like, I need some more of that. And I'm like, okay. So I was going on a business trip. And so I decided, I'm like, hey, I'm going to call Ross, call Justin, call Dennis, and just have everybody come over some wings and some beer. Yeah. Made about, I don't know, four dozen wings, whatever. And uh, so after about a dozen wings each and about three beers each, we were like, we, we brought up the sauces. <laughs> Ross brought his sauces. I had already started acquiring at this point. And we started using the curry sauce. And they were like, man, this is this is really good. Like We like this more than... Pretty much anything else. And it's not just because you made it. It just it has a really crazy good flavor. Yeah. And it still has heat. And so we went through a whole bottle. And they were like, we, I think we have something. So I'm up in Ohio, in the middle of nowhere, Ohio. And um, I get stuck in a snowstorm. And so I end up at a hotel in Zelina. Or uh, Zelina, uh, what the hell is it called? It begins with the Z. I don't know. It's outside, oh. outside of... Um, uh, like Akron area? Yes. Yeah, Zanesville? Of. Zanesville. I'm over in Zanesville. Thank you. I keep thinking it's the open. I'm like, no, that's, like, that's north of here. I said Ohio. Um, yeah, Z- <laughs> Zanesville. And uh, I was getting ready to get on the road to come home the next morning, and I, get, I start getting phone calls. And Ross is like, dude, I think we, we need to start a business. Like, I think we need to do this. And I'm like, okay. And he's always wanted to have a hot sauce business. He's always been a big fan <laughs> okay. of this. So he was really the driving force. And so I was like, all right, well, let's get the other guys on the phone. So we, I'm, I'm, I'm driving home. We have this conference call. 
like, let's do it. Like, let's let's make a company. Let's figure out how to do this. Okay. So no guidance, no knowledge of what we were walking into, right? Just blind four shot. Of, the four, four of us. you deciding to make this thing. With zero, zero input or approval from our spouses. Uh, That's a bad choice. Nobody was quitting your jobs, though. Nobody was quitting our jobs. Um, but we also took on a lot of extra time and a lot of extra work <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. without consulting spouses. Yeah. Not suggested, but... Avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, just don't do that. Yeah. Make sure you, you run through these things. Um, now, granted, all of our spouses have been uh, very supportive and big helps. I mean, my wife comes down and helps me run events. Uh, Ross's wife comes down and helps events. Like, we, they help seal and label bottles. And, yeah. Um, they don't help with the cooking, but they do help with that piece. How long did it take? Like, how quickly did you run into those issues? Ooh. Like, how quickly did people start catching shit from their wives? Uh, the first cook. <laughs> so, like, um, how soon after this, so this mine, conference call was that? Uh, mine was the next week. <laughs> okay, okay, um, okay. Because okay. I made the curry sauce again. And we were, at this point, like... We weren't in a shared kitchen space. We weren't selling anything. We were just trying to – we ordered some bottles off of Amazon. We were making for ourselves. Yeah. Okay, let's let's try to get a recipe down, right? And we were giving bottles to friends and family. Like, we were pH testing it, making sure it was safe. Yeah. We were following the guidelines. We weren't we weren't legal to sell, so we weren't selling. Yeah. Right? And so I made the curry sauce in the house. And then our house smelled like curry for seven <laughs> days. So that's that's when my, my time started, okay, right? Okay, okay. It was, okay. number one, I made a mess. Number two, my house smelled like curry. Uh, number three, now we have bottles laying everywhere, uh-huh. and why? So my my house became more cluttered. <laughs> Has not gotten better, FYI. <laughs> gotten worse. Um, and so the other guys, so we, we started, Ross said, well, I have a bigger kitchen. We have a, you know, hood vent and everything else. Come on over. Cooked over there. Yeah, guys, we can't cook this in my house anymore. <laughs> okay. So we start trying to go through. Um, finally, we had two of the guys that said, like, Ross said, yeah, as long as it's not curry, we're good. And uh, all right, so we just didn't we didn't cook curry for a while. Um, we had we had developed Armo honey mopolanos and our roasted ghosted garlic at this time, and so the, and those smell those smell amazing when you cook them. So yeah. like, wives didn't yeah they didn't care right. The house smells like garlic or the house smells well, so, like okay. So I, you had already you had already formed the business at this point. The business or? was formed. Okay. Um, we still had not gone through uh, licensing. Um, okay. Because we didn't know what we wanted to do per se, but we were we were filed as an LLC. Okay. Um, and we were. What trying, do you mean by the licensing? So like, we have to be licensed. Um, we have to go through the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and the FDA for what we do now. Um, so there was licensing we had to do to file to be to be able to sell our sauces. Okay. Um, once, because Pennsylvania does not have what are called. Um, uh, I almost said heritage laws, but that's not it. It's it's. Um, other other states have them where you can basically make things in your house and just sell them. Okay. Um, um, cottage lo- co- cottage house, cottage laws is what okay. they're called. Um, and we don't have those in PA, right? Yay. So it made our life a lot easier. So we had to find a shared kitchen space, right? So everything we're doing out of the house, we could have done out of our house, but somebody has to come in and inspect. Could Why? you have done like a co-packing type of we situation yeah, or something we like that? Okay. We didn't want to. Uh, and I'll, For, get, I'll get into okay. more of that in okay. a little bit. That's a decision we have made um, through and through. Uh, and we're, we're leaning, we're possibly going that direction in the future, but it's going to be, there are very, very heavy stipulations for us to do that. Okay. Um, so we knew we wanted to cook it because we wanted to make sure that the consistency and the quality was exactly what we were expecting to do. And it also saves you an immense amount of money. Yeah. Right? Like, it costs you time. Yeah. But for us, that was a bonding experience. We yeah. were getting together, hanging out, cooking, BSing, having, you know, just having yeah. a good time with you. Like just yeah. spending time with each yeah. other, right? Um, once we were done cooking, had a couple beers, relaxed. Yeah. Cool. Um, and so we were, we were trying to figure out the best way to do this, right? We, we knew we had to sterilize bottles. Well, boiling bottles sucked. Well, so, okay, so you were starting to make more before you could sell yes. again. We were trying what to work on thought? processes. Okay. I'm a, I'm a process person. Okay. That's pretty much what I've done with what I do now is, is I build a lot of new processes. That's what we all do. We focus on, I'm a hyper-efficient person mm-hmm. um, to the point where it's driven by my laziness. 
right? If I can do something in five minutes, I want to do it in five minutes. Yeah. If I can, if it, if you're saying it takes 15, but I can do it in five, I'm, I'm doing it in five. Yeah. Right. As long as it doesn't, the quality isn't affected. Yeah. And so quality is our number one priority bar none. Yeah. Um, that's why we use the ingredients that we do, but we want to make sure that our processes were able to be scalable. Okay. Um, Cause we knew we had a good product. Um, we've been told this, we had people offering us money. We weren't buying, we weren't selling anything, but we knew we had a very good product. When, when strangers were tasting it saying, I want to buy that. Yeah. And it's not your friends blowing smoke. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a very different experience. Yeah. And so we were trying to figure out the best way to increase our productivity, to make our, our recipes scalable. Cause when, we, when we're starting out, we're talking like we were making like 12 bottles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like in our first time we cooked, we made 12 bottles and it took us eight and a half hours. <laughs> okay. Oh now we look at this now and we laugh at what we did and we were proud of ourselves, right? Like we, yeah. we made our product. It's in a bottle. It's safe. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> we're not going to kill yeah. somebody if they try to eat this. Yeah. Like that's a win. Yeah. You know? And so that was our baseline, but you have to start somewhere and you yeah. have to, you have to learn. So you weren't to, wasting a, you weren't wasting a ton at that point because no. you weren't doing oh, no, massive. We were, we were wasting money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but still not like it could. I mean, you weren't making massive batches. No. Oh no, no, no. And we were we were weren't wasting money from the perspective of uh, we were buying in very small bulk. Like we were not, not even bulk. Right. We were going to like Giant Eagle and yeah. buying Fresno peppers. Yeah. Okay. And that that's a fortune, right? So we were spending money that way because you're buying them in a bag. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we learned what we had to do. We learned what the peppers were like. We, we tasted everything. We figured out how the consistency should be. Um, so it was, a, it was a full learning process that we did. Yeah. And I regret none of it. Um, now that's not the case, right? Like it's, it's grown exponentially since yeah. then to, you know, we're producing 400 bottles in, you know, two and a half hours now. So Damn. that's a massive uh, enhancement <laughs> yeah, from where we yeah, were. Yeah. But we've also sunk our money back into it. Yeah. And it started because we did these baby steps, right? Mm-hmm. We you, we didn't try to run before we could even prop ourselves up, like, yeah. let alone crawl, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things that there's a lot of businesses do right now is they, they get their money. We have to go full force. Mm-hmm. And, and if you do that, you skip over. You, you can, It can work it, for the short term. It can. But long term, you find yourself in a spot that – you're going to have to fix those things. Exactly. And maybe, like, it's not that that's wrong or right. Like, it's it, it's, it's a different approach. It's a different approach. And depending right. on your situation, because if you guys are in a different situation where you have to be making money quickly, yeah. like, if you all don't have full-time jobs, things are way different. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? Um, like, I mean, we, Because we, it's we, like, you got to start, what do we got to do to make, to, how can we sell this now? Exactly. Um, and go back and fix things, but... Now you, you're like you, you did that work in in an easier phase because there is nothing. Right. You don't and have we to were, rebuild anything. We were taking, you know, we would get done with work, we'd all go over to Ross's house and we cook. And so it's like, oh hey, we're gonna be done at five o'clock. We'll meet at Ross's house at five thirty. We'll have some pizza real fast, and then we'll start cooking and we'll mm-hmm. be done, you know, by like eight, nine o'clock. Yeah. Once we got things down a little bit more, right? Like the first time was like that was a Saturday. We got over there at like uh-huh. noon and we didn't leave till eight thirty because we had to run to the we, I mean we had to run to the grocery store like six times <laughs> oh, you know we oh my god <laughs> it was it anything you could forget we forgot right like okay and then it was we were still we were still building the recipe right so it wasn't final it was oh we wow. wanted to do okay. this we wanted to do that we wanted to be more like this or less like this um so we were adjusting the recipe on the fly and then as we figured it out you know and then we we had our recipe we we're writing everything down we cooked a batch, realized we forgot onions. Onions make a big difference when you're cooking something, right? Mm-hmm. Like they have a flavor. They add to it. Mm-hmm. So we're like, okay, well, this this batch then, these five bottles just get scrapped. And the next ones are going to go because we were making very small things. And so when, when you talk about uh, growth, at that point we were – we had a stainless steel funnel and a ladle. And I was filling the bottles with a ladle, right? I was the ladle. That was my job. So we all four of us had a roll, right? So somebody grabbed the bottles that were sanitized and passed them to me. I filled them. Somebody else took them. Captain, and the other guy wiped them down because they were a freaking mess, yeah. right? Um, and we held that and 
after we were licensed into an industrial kitchen, <laughs> we were still using that same process up until like the end of 2020. Okay. Okay. So like, it's like we were two full still, years. We were still doing that because we we were still trying to make money. Yeah. And so we had seen um we'd seen a video about some equipment. We're like, we're gonna buy that. And so we did. Right? We we sunk that was our first step of sinking our money that we had been we were now licensed, we uh-huh. were now selling stuff, right? Let's let's buy this because it's gonna help us out. And it did. How long did it take you guys to get licensed and everything? Um, so for, uh, so like based on the, if the day that you decided to start the business was day one, how long after that do you think it took? So we started the business April of 2019. Okay. Okay. And we did not get licensed until almost the end of February of 2020. Oh, wow. We so started what? the process probably in the November time frame of 2019. Okay. And because we didn't want to sell something that was inferior, we didn't want to do things in a way that were not correct. So we were studying the FDA guidelines and the Department of Health guidelines. We wanted to make sure we were following their processes and procedures the way mm-hmm. that we needed to. So we weren't going to hurt. We, our, we can't hurt somebody, yeah. right? If we hurt somebody, our the odds of us, instead of just hurting somebody, is killing somebody. Yeah. Because we deal with botulism, right? And botulism just... It, yeah. It kills. Yeah. Right? So we had to make sure we're not doing that. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> what can we do to not good, do that That's a thing? good goal. Right. So we also – and then that was just – when we when I say we got licensed, that initial license was just for us to sell face-to-face. Okay. Okay. So that wasn't us going into stores. We didn't get licensed for resale – like for, for wholesale mm-hmm. for – until October of 2020. Okay. And because of the fact that we want to take a very cautious approach to that because if you start dealing with a place like Walmart, right, where they're like, hey, I want to buy bottles from you for $2 and we're not making bottles for $2. Yeah. But we want to be at Walmart and we're taking a loss, that becomes a problem and you put yourself out of business. Uh-huh. Right? And so we want to make sure that what we were doing was, number one, sustainable. Can we meet with demand of a place ordering boxes from us, right? Because we're going to chart, but they're going to have to buy a case. Yeah. We're not, we're not just dropping off two or three bottles and like they have to buy 12. Yeah. And what happens if they run out of that 12 in the first week and they need 12 more? How do we meet that demand? And we were, we were always thinking worst case scenario, right? And worst case scenario being we don't have the product or we can't turn the product around fast enough. Yeah. How were you, how were you sourcing your, like, how were you sourcing everything at that time? So, or and how has that changed? Um, we, as we started, um, our director Ross and Ross and I, we were both were in audit at this point. We really started kicking everything into full force. We were in audit. Um, when, from the time we started the the from that dinner that we decided we were uh-huh. going to do business through everything, I, we were both in audit at this point, and I and in uh, PPG, and our director who came in. We had already been founded, whatever. We had already we already had our logo. We had T-shirts mm-hmm. made, right? Like, we had stickers done. He came in, and he loved, and I mean love the fact that we were doing this, right? And so he started using it as a networking thing at work where he was inviting other teams to come and have wings with us and enjoy the sauces and talk about PPG work and how we can work together. That's right? cool. So it wasn't, it wasn't, us centric. It wasn't mm-hmm. benefiting us in the fa- except for the fact that they were able to taste our sauces. Yeah. We had other sauces there too. It was benefiting PPG. He was just using us as a catalyst for that conversation. Yeah. Which we were grateful for. And so he gave he gave us um he lived in New Jersey at the time and he came back. He he's moving into Pittsburgh and there's a very big uh garden nursery over there. And so he picked up plants and he brought them to us. And so Ross took six and I took six. Ross has died. Um, because he left them outside and it hailed and it destroyed them. And I had actually um, stolen my daughter's playhouse and put the peppers inside of it <laughs> okay. because it was protecting them. Yeah. And so whenever I planted them, I had, we had six plants. That started in 2019. We had six plants. And so we harvested what we needed. We had, you know, ghost pepper. We had a Carolina Reaper plant. We had a scorpion plant. Um, we had devil's tongue plant and we had a pepper X plant. These are what he bought us. Um, and there was one more and I forget what it was. Uh, 
because we had, like I said, we had six. And so I, you know, I nurtured them and I, I, I fell in love with that aspect too. And I've never been a gardener. Yeah. Never done that before. Loved it. So the next year, right, we went from, from a chili pepper perspective, we went from six plants to uh, 40 plants. We built some big raised beds and we put them in and they grew. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We went from six to 20. Okay. Because um, we just dug out a bigger plot of land and grew everything there. And uh, we, we had different varieties. We had more of each variety because we were needing those. Uh-huh. And so we were trying to use the peppers that we were able to grow. So then last year, we built the raised bed and we got another garden plot. And then this year, we expanded that garden plot. Um, so we went from six plants in 2019 to 200 plants in 2022. Did you plan originally on growing the peppers? Like what, how were you guys, like, I guess how much thought did, like how much thought was put into that aspect of it at the beginning? It became a means to an end, um, because we're working with specialty peppers, right? It's not just jalapenos or poblano peppers, right? Or, but we don't grow bell peppers. We don't grow any onions, right? We, we all source that. We were going to to Walmart or Giant Eagle, whatever, buying our produce. Now we work with produce distributors because it's just a lot easier and we can get them by the case. Um, so when you start talking about Carolina Reapers, can't just go and buy those. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very hard. Right? Yeah. I can't call somebody and be like, "Oh, I need a pound of Carolina Reapers." Like they're gonna be like, mm, "Good luck." Yeah, right. Like we got we got ghost peppers once, and they cost us a fortune, and we wasted them. They ended up rotting, and we threw them away um, because we just didn't use them. Yeah, and so um, that was a big waste. And we we've had some situations of that where it's like, okay, we wasted money. How do we not do that again? Yeah, right? what can we do to stop that? Well, and I'm sure that's. That's easier. I, I think a lot of times when it's just, I mean, there's probably downsides to this too, but um, a lot of times if you're the only person, that reflection becomes very difficult oh, because yeah. it's like you're adapting and you need to make sure that you're just continuing to move forward. You guys have four. There's four of you. Three of us now. But okay. yeah, and it, uh, up until uh, this year, there were four. Okay. Um, and... But we were all able to lean on each other and say, hey, I'm going to – if you talk to any of the guys, they'll tell you I'm the one that does the garden, right? Like they'll mm-hmm. come out and help with stuff now and then. But I'm the one that I, – I figure out what plants we're going to plant. I get the, the ground ready. They – you know, I plant everything. They'll come out and help weed and pick peppers. Um, so I'm, I'm really the organizer for that aspect. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, I run everything by them. We decide, yeah, yes, this is yeah. the this is the appropriate amount of peppers, or you know, they just take my word and say, yes, we're good. Um, but so we grew we grew our reapers and we didn't have enough. We were coming out with our sauce called the masterpiece, right? And we we knew needed reapers and we needed reapers to make it. And our our crop that year was not great, right? They just tons of peppers, they were just all green. And we didn't want to use green reapers. We wanted to use red reapers. We wanted them to be, you know, ripened and everything mm-hmm. else. We wanted that, that full-blown fa- flavor. And so I started looking around like, hey, where can we buy reapers from? And so we found a place. And the cheapest the cheapest I could find them for is $35 a pound. Okay. Okay. And we needed more than two pounds. <laughs> okay. So we have $70 plus. Actually, we have, what, $105, not including shipping, wrapped up. In peppers for this sauce, for one sauce. Yeah. And it was like, okay, this is not going to happen again. Like, we need to grow our own. And so during that time, we've also done a cost-benefit analysis. We do a lot of these. Um, I, As I was harvesting everything, right, I was weighing it out. Hey, we grew this many jalapenos from this harvest. Uh, the next time I picked peppers, we had this much, and I kept uh-huh. a tracking sheet of it, so I knew what we had. And that was – we, we – take the tops off of them and we split them in half and that way we make sure that the pepper is good uh-huh. all the way through because you can have a perfectly good looking pepper that's completely rotten on the inside. Yeah. So we didn't want to put that into our sauce. <laughs> um, so we split them and so that's what we weighed, right? We weighed the final cut of everything. It wasn't, oh, this is what we pulled yeah. off the garden, right? Yeah. This is what we're actually able to use. Yeah. And we we went to do a big cook of Masterpiece using our jalapenos and we used the entire harvest of the summer 
And I said, well, this is stupid. <laughs> like, guys, we're not doing this anymore. So how do we feel about just buying our jalapenos? Because it's not worth our time and effort uh-huh. to grow these plants and use that plot space for something else that we could. Yeah, that you can't get. Right. For the reapers or the scorpion yeah. peppers or whatever. And, like, so the only we're, – we're at the point now where the only traditional pepper we grow is habaneros. And that's just because they produce in such mass quantities mm-hmm. that – and we still spend like if you were to buy them from a produce bar, you're paying five dollars a pound. I can I can literally go out to my garden today and pick twenty pounds of peppers in like twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. So it's like it's not even. I'm, I'm, I wish I was exaggerating. I have, <laughs> and this year is bad. Like for a spe- for a very different reason. Um, we we have so many and we don't know what to do with them. Like it's bad because <laughs> certain peppers, the pepper plants that were supposed to be something else weren't those they were orange habaneros and then we had bought habaneros because we were told from the company our habanero crop died so we're going to refund you the money and then we went out and just bought our own plants and so (laughs) typically speaking like we can have 10 habanero plants and that'll produce us enough for the entire year up into the next season Mm -hmm. right because we only have a few sauces that use them uh and they grow so many peppers yeah. at one time. And they're, they're pretty – and everything's down to the we, – we do everything to the gram level because you have to. Yeah. Right? For nutritional reasons and for um, acidity reasons, we have to trace everything to the gram level. Um, so when we're saying like, oh, we need X amount of grams of this, like, well, crap, that was one harvest and we have four more harvests or five more harvests for the year. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so we we usually – we would have 10 habanero plants and this year we have 23. So, okay, we have a lot, um, okay, way more than we were expecting to have. We didn't get scotch bonnets this year, which is un, you know unfortunate, but yeah. So, um, as far as going back to that licensing piece, right? You, that was one of the questions you had asked. Uh, we got licensed to retail ourselves. We got licensed to wholesale, um, and then you have to go through uh, what's called a process authority. So we have to basically send our recipe and our we do it a different way. So we get our we get our stuff pH tested right in Wexford. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a nationally recognized lab, um, and they charge very little money. Um, we use Microback. And if you want to send it to what's called a process authority, they, they review this information, and they do the pH testing. It's like three or four times the cost. Plus, okay. you have to ship them a bottle. Yeah. Right? I can drive to Wexford and back yeah. in like yeah. you know, 55 minutes or whenever. Yeah. So it's worth my time to do that as opposed you to can pay hit up for the shipping. While you're there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we um So we, do you have to do that every every new every new sauce. Okay. Yeah, we have to get it pH tested and then we ship that over. Uh, we we send the documentation over to the process authority and they basically say, here's your pH, here's your recipe, this is what gives you your acidity. Uh, don't change anything. And if we change something, we have to run it through them again and pay another fee, mm-hmm. right? But we get documentation. We have to upload that documentation to – we have to get the Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, and to the FDA. So from time of – you've got a new a new recipe that you want to kick out. How long does it take for you to actually be able to sell that recipe? Um, with the new process authority we have, a, it, it really – like so we're on our game. Like we, we are – gung-ho all of us are in you know we have a time to, to sit down and send out the emails that we need to do um if we say hey we finalize this recipe and i say okay i'm going to work with the process authority and we work with our graphic designer and he's going to make our label and we have our description and we have mm-hmm. the name and we we enter everything in for our nutritional facts right uh about a week okay um, okay. And that's, that's if we're on our game right yeah um but still, it's not like months n- it, it was when we used our other process authority, that it like their shortest time was like six weeks. The guy okay. that we use now is like a week on average for the same cost. Um, so okay. when we did our process authority. We had to rush process everything because we needed to get it done now. Yeah, and it was double the cost. And as they they got it done in um, at that point, it was one to two weeks. And it was on two weeks side. Now it's like four to five weeks to rush it. Through hmm. the same process authority. So we decided, like, we got we got tipped off from another sauce manufacturer. He's like, hey, go use this guy. Same thing. Usability. Uh, just cost you the same amount of money, just way less time. Yeah. Great. We love that. And so for us, um, people ask us how long it takes to make a sauce, like, to come up with a recipe. Mm-hmm. And we've had sauces that take literally two hours. We have sauces that take six months. 
it just really depends on yeah. what we're trying to accomplish. So, like our barbecue sauces, those were, I mean, like six months of work because we we wanted to make something that was not the same as what you normally. Yeah. We had to stand out, right? We had to do something different. Yeah. Um, but well, for, and it also seems like you guys are making sauces to kind of fill your own needs. We so yeah, it's like, and that's one of the reasons we started the company. Um, was because we had had so many sauces that were hot for the sake of being hot. They yeah. just were spicy. They didn't taste good or to us, right? They, yeah. the, the creators yeah. must think they taste good, yeah. right? Um, and we don't want to talk poorly about any other sauce company or any other sauce in general, right? Like we're, it's a community. It's really cool how much uh, each person looks out for the other and they recommend your products across to other people too, which is, we've gotten a lot yeah, of business nice. that way, which is great. Yeah. Um, and I'm coming from the corporate world where it's dog eat dog uh-huh. and you're trying to put your competitor out of business, uh-huh. right? Like, it was a very unique experience for us, but um, you know we we don't want to talk poorly. But there were flavor profiles that we we wanted to see that weren't being met, or they were being attempted, but we didn't think they were great. Yeah, right. Or they were just a spicy sauce with no flavor, or it just tasted like peppers, right? And that, that's not a challenge, right? For us, we wanted we wanted the challenge of making something that is spicy. And still has an incredible flavor to it that's not just peppers. Yeah. Right? Unless we're trying to make it just peppers. Yeah. Um, and so that's really what we prided ourselves on. We said, okay, we we want this. We only want to use all natural ingredients. We only want to use, uh, you know, the freshest produce that we can. Um and we want to do it ourselves. We don't want somebody stepping in and being the middleman because we it, – it's not even like a control freak aspect. It's I don't know what you're doing with my product, and now my name is on the product that you made. So it better yeah. be up to snuff from what we do. Yeah. Right? It, if, if they open the bottle of the sauce that you made and they open the bottle of the sauce that we made, it better taste identical or better. Yeah. Right? I'm not turning down better. If you can do a better yeah, weekend, yeah, yeah, great. Like, yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. But if it tastes worse or subpar or watered down, I don't want to do business with you. Yeah. And if we, we've talked with a co-packer and they said that to us, right? He said, if my – I want you guys to be assholes. Like I want you to be, you know, real sticklers about this because it's your product, right? Like I'm representing you. I'm making your product. And if you're – if you don't care about the quality of your product and you're just saying, hey, just make it for uh-huh. me and it's great, like – I don't want to do business with you. Yeah. And I'm going, that's awesome. Like, we're all about that. And it, that was a cool feeling to have another business owner that he got into co-packing because of that. Now, we'd have to travel like four and a half hours in New York to do this. Um, it's not ideal. No. But we like, <laughs> yeah. if, that's the, yeah. if that's what it takes for us to do this the right way mm-hmm. um, to get into bigger markets, because we can't meet the demand by ourselves. We're going to yeah. like distributors won't work with you if you don't have the capability of producing at that level. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. Well, if you're so if you're exploring that, like, would you still be sourcing everything? Like, how would you? Yeah, we'd how are you to, thinking about well, that? We would have to find better ways to source our peppers. Um, and there, there are places we can do, like we, yeah. we can call pucker, Butt, um, funny name, but they're down in South Carolina. And so it's, it's ran, it's owned by Ed Curry who created the Carolina Reaper mm-hmm. and the Apollo pepper and the pepper X. Um, so if you've heard of any of these peppers that yeah. are out there, he did those. Um, and he's a cool guy. We've talked to him a couple of times. Um, but they do pepper mashes that you can buy that are non-salted. Uh, so we would basically have to buy some, figure out how that correlates mm-hmm. to our homegrown peppers and the other part is, too, we th- those sauces that we would have them manufacture, the goal is we would never see them, right? We would still be manufacturing our piece. Yeah. Those would be going distributed across the country to stores that we oh, wouldn't wow. even okay. see, okay. right? So um, we wouldn't be going to pick it up. It'd be going – yeah. the distributor would come pick it up, and they would take it. I'm sorry. I'm talking with my hands yeah, a lot. Yeah, that's um, It's video, too, so. Yeah, so it's uh, <laughs> like we would still be sourcing our local areas – um, and shipping out our own orders and things like that. So would, it'd be a two front attack. Would the, you, so if you're, I mean, you're obviously still like figuring all this out. So, but now I'm just curious, like if you're going to have somebody co-pack, is the, you guys still want, like you still want to produce it? Like, it seems mm-hmm. like you could spend that time doing other things to help further the business. If you're already paying for somebody else to do it. So there's 
Sorry, they hit me in the back of the throat. <laughs> um, there are some different perspectives on this. Um, so one being that co-packing costs a lot of money, mm-hmm. right? And the reason that we don't have our own facility and we use a shared kitchen space, we don't have a co-packer, and we use our time is because we get better value out of our time than by doing that in some facets, yeah. right? Um, we also have 10 normal sauces that we keep in stock regularly, and we have three limited edition sauces currently, and we're looking to expand that. Um, and so when you talk about co-packing, they're making one line of sauce, right? So if we were – the one we're talking about is our taco sauce, which we would – we want to rebrand and everything mm-hmm. else. Um, and there's there's a lot of thought that goes behind the rebranding of it, uh, basically because we have people coming like, I don't like taco sauce. And it's like, well, it's more than just taco sauce. Yeah. But that they see the name taco yeah. sauce and they're like, no, I don't, oh, I don't need that. I don't right. even so eat tacos. Yeah. That, that's the concern, right? Yeah. So it, that comes into the perspective – I'm hoping to get more into that of, you know, these thought processes down the road. But – so we would give them the taco sauce, right? We would still make our own. Um, because we're, the goal is for them to ship everything to a distributor and it be gone. It doesn't take us that much time to cook it, right? Like we can do one cook a taco sauce in, you know, three hours, say five hours with prep and everything else, right? And, and make almost 500 bottles of that because it's a very large producing sauce for us. Okay. Uh, and, and if we have all three of us in the kitchen, um, we can do a third kettle in the same amount of time and produce, you know, 700 bottles. Uh, in the same time, right? So w- when I talked about earlier, right, we – eight hours to make 12 bottles mm-hmm. with four of us. We're when I said we we're doing 400 bottles in two and a half hours, three hours, and we're only using two of us. Yeah. So that's not even – worst case scenario, we bring somebody else in, right? We call somebody, then they can do more of the – I don't want to say the grunt work, but the grunt work, yeah. right? Like they're they're doing the dishes. They're – they're not putting anything in the recipe. They're not. Yeah. They're not doing any of the prep work. Like they're, they're grabbing bottles. They're the gopher, right? Yeah. Go get me another right tray of bottles. Go get you know. Go put this in the sink and rinse it out. Yeah. Go you know get this pot cleaned as soon as we're done with it, so that way we can be done. Yeah. Um. Go load the car with all the bottles once we're done. Um, that type of a job where you can have three of us focusing on the work and then somebody gophering. Yeah. You get way better production quality out of that because. We're not splitting our time. Yeah. We're able to go consistently through, so our timeline shrinks dramatically. Yeah. Okay. How – there's a couple – I mean, there's there's some things that don't really relate right now that I want to get into, but mm-hmm. I also – the, like, production side is super interesting. But let's kind of shift for yeah, sure, absolutely. a couple minutes. Um, okay. You had four of you. Yes. How in the world does that work? Like, I, and we've touched on it already. I'm, it's got to help that it's not the main thing. Right. Um, so It probably not, wouldn't be possible at the beginning. Honestly, if that. it was the main thing, we would probably be so much further ahead than where we are now. With the group that we have, okay. um, very tight-knit, talk every day, uh, friends – I, I'm the, the, the centerpiece of the friendship, yeah. right? So I'm friends with Ross, I'm friends with Justin, I'm friends with Dennis, yeah. Justin, if I could actually say his name properly. Um, and I've known them for my entire life. And Justin met Dennis through me, and they met Ross through me. So, like, I'm, I'm that centerpiece. So uh, Justin is no longer with the company. He took a job at a one of the big four auditing firms, and so he had to leave outside employment. He was not allowed to have any. Mm. There's so many re- requirements and restrictions yeah. to go with that. So he he stepped away. Um, and, like, it it impacted us in different ways. Um, we learned a lot from him. Mm-hmm. And we've taken a lot of lessons that he's given us and, and some of his advice. And we, he, we still heed some of that advice. Um, certain things that we didn't agree with. And that's the one thing about a partnership. We don't agree with each other all the time. Yeah. There's a lot of arguing. You have to have the group of people that's capable of arguing, though. Yeah. And the kind that's not going to be insulted when I say, I think your idea is stupid. And when I say like that, I mean, we are legitimately that blunt with each other because we have to be. Yeah. Um, there, if, you, if you beat around the bush and you sugarcoat it, you don't get your point across and you waste time. We need all the time we can get because we're working with such a short amount of it because mm. it is not the main thing. Yeah. Right. If it was the main thing, we would have more time. We probably wouldn't be as far as we are from that perspective, 
But if I was able to dedicate 40 hours of my time to Maestro's a week, good Lord. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine where I'd be with, if I'm only focusing 10 hours a week yeah. in the evenings, yeah. right? Um, how are you guys, like, how are you, do you have a structure to, like, I imagine there are times when it's just, like, shit pops off where there's an argument. But do you have a structure around how are like the times where you know some important decision is coming up? Like, how are you handling those conversations? They, you can just feel them. Um, it's a weird, it's like an intrinsic kind of knowledge. Um, now, if we're talking about a process improvement or buying a piece of equipment, right? We all kind of feel the same strain, right? Okay. Or if I'm doing the role, uh, so when it came to ladling bottles, right? We all knew that it was a hamstring for us, right? I was ladling. Yeah. Yeah. 400 bottles yeah. in, in, you know, it took a long time. My arm hurt. Um, wish I'd use my left arm because my disc throwing would probably be a little bit better. Okay. <laughs> but it was my right. So, um, we were working on that strength. Yeah, just exactly. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, I said, guys, we need to buy something. We need to do this differently. Like I can't do this anymore. This is yeah. not feasible. This is not sustainable. And, well, and how many bottles are you guys moving? Like roughly like, well, either per month or per year. Like, where are you guys at? Last year was like twelve to fifteen thousand. Okay, okay, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot for it's a, a lot side of game, scooping. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot so, of scooping. Um, you know, it's like oh, it's not bad. Like, and now we're cooking every week. Where before it was oh, wow. ad hoc, right? Like it was like oh, we're gonna cook this week, and then maybe we wouldn't cook for two more weeks mm-hmm. or three more weeks. So the demand wasn't there at that time. The demand is there, and the fact that like we're we took some we took a few weeks off, and it's catching up with us now. So we have like multiple cooks scheduled over the next four weeks. Where okay. We're cooking more than once a week. Yeah, um, just to make pace with what we're doing. Yeah. So so the decision when you're making those decisions, like how are you? Do you have a structure to it, or, or I mean, you guys are friends, so that helps for it, sure. It helps. And it hurts in some ways, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but it, it came down to me saying, guys. This is inefficient. My arm hurts. I want to do something better. And they said, okay, what can we do? Right? And it's, it's on me yeah. to yeah, prove yeah. what it is. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, when you're when we, we've gone well, through this. And that's a, I think that's a good point where if you're going to come with a problem. I better come with a solution, yes. too. Or at least, at least be, have some options. Some options, right? Some options or, like, at least a path for us to start to move down. Exactly. Um, and, so, and that works forever. That's, and we, we've done this a couple of different times from different equipment that we've had. Um so we found uh, they're basically big 10-gallon brew kettles that have a spout at the bottom that are gravity-fed, and you just spout the, you know, pour yeah. the bottles that way. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Like, increase our productivity dramatically. So um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Lieutenant Dan for a second, and you, I'll get into why we call it this. So our other issue was a blender, right? We need to have a blender that works. Uh, we're That's helpful. <laughs> big produce. <laughs> Large quantities of produce, especially when we're cooking, you know, you're cooking ten gallons at, you know, at least ten gallons at a time. Yeah. Um, we 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 had one of those little immersion blenders, you know, that, that uh-huh. you get from like Bed Bath and Beyond or whatever. That lasted one cook. We ex- it blew up. I mean, like <laughs> literally exploded. Okay. It smoked. It almost caught on fire. It was like, guys, this is a, this is gonna work. So, Ross went did some research. We bought another blender. It lasted a little bit longer. We chopped things a lot more finely. And, but it's still, like, it took forever to blend a kettle of sauce. Yeah. Right? Because you little thing, not doing anything. Yeah. So Ross found this thing. It's a big, it's a giant cone. And it's one solid sheet of stainless steel, uh, the same type of stainless steel we have our kettle in. Uh, so it's food safe. Uh-huh. And it had this, basically a big propeller on the bottom. It was a blender. Okay. And you just throw everything in there. And it just vortexes down and it blended everything. Now... It didn't blend it to a liquid, a full liquid consistency, but it gave us like uh, almost a salsa consistency. Yeah. Which we then were able, and it, you, it had a pedal, you stepped on it, and it poured into a pot. Like you that could tilt great. it and pour it. It was awesome until you had to clean the damn thing because it was a pain in the ass because it was heavy. Yeah. Right? So you're having to pick this thing up uh-huh. and hose it out, uh-huh. dump it. And <laughs> yeah. It takes two people to hold it, you know. Um, and the fact that nobody got injured from doing that is incredible. Um, but. We bought this thing, and our productivity increased dramatically. So we were able to pour it into the kettle and then use the immersion blender, the little one, and blend it all down to liquid. Well, then we said, okay, guys, like, 
this isn't working either. Like, it's still taking too long. We're mm-hmm. having additional steps in. Let's just go out and find an industrial immersion blender. So we have one now that's, uh, I think it's like an 18-inch shaft, and it has a one-horsepower motor on it. <laughs> and it pulverizes Jesus. everything, right? Like, we chop onions in half, maybe to quarters if we're really feeling <laughs> it. There's a big onion, and that's all, you know, it just it destroys yeah. it, right? And it liquefies. And we don't, we don't care about we, we want it to be liquid. Yeah. Right? We don't strain our sauce. We there's still pulp in it, but we still need it to be liquid. Yeah. We don't want to serve you a salsa. We're not a salsa company, right? Yeah. That that consistency is a big difference for us. Yeah. And we do have thin sauces, we have thick sauces, right? Um, but it pulverizes everything. And it, we it, we have a you know clamp that sits on the side of the kettle and it just attaches in there and it just blends. That's fantastic. Right? And as loud as all hell, but it does the job. So we actually bought a second one of those because we're just like, okay, we have one. We need a second one in case this one blows up uh-huh. in the middle of a cook. Um, we've had it stop a couple times. It's overheated. Uh, we, we put a little too much on it, and it was like, okay, like, let's figure this out. But um, those are the type of things that we've, we've just kind of come to as a company and said, okay, let's do this. And then the bigger, the bigger one is what events are we going to do? Um, those are the big decisions, right, because that's where we make our money. How do we spend our time the, the best way to make the most amount of money? Um, and there are certain events that we've done that they aren't the best events, but we yeah. have a lot of fun being there. Yeah. That, that's yeah. like from a business perspective, it's not great, right? But from a – we are the business. It's us, right? Yeah. So if we're going to spend our time, like let's go have some fun doing something yeah. too, yeah. right? So if you're talking like, hey, you want to come to like Cinco de Mayo and have tacos and drink, we're in. Like if you're if you're like oh you're gonna come stand here and sit in the baking sun for four hours and you're gonna make more money like we're probably in for that too but we're gonna be a lot less happy about yeah, it yeah yeah so those are the decisions that you know and we we've made some decisions that we haven't agreed with right we we found out we made a mistake or it, you just overcome it and you say okay well we screwed up let's not do it again yeah and, and you know even with recipes we messed up recipes and it's like well okay. Like we scrap it, yeah. right? Or you have, you know, we we had a a band like the the ceiling bands that come on like the tops of like for liquid. One of those fell in, and we blended it, and we caught it, and we were like, the whole batch just gets dumped down the drain because we can't serve this to anybody. So oh. you throw away hours of work just uh-huh. down the drain, right? But we'd rather do that. We'd rather lose serve somebody plastic, our cost yeah, than you know our cost of time than hurt somebody because that that impacts us. Far yeah. more yeah. than our little mistake, right? Yeah. It's just owning that mistake and saying, "Hey, we screwed up. Let's not do that again." Yeah, and we we always put something into place that makes sure that we don't do that anymore. Have you had any with that many people? Have you had any times where you, because you've also at least prior to this year, like you had four people, so split decisions. Yeah, nope. Any okay? Never. Have you had any, like, any times where decisions got pretty heated? Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, arguments, uh, people stepping away for a day or two, um, just saying, like, hey, I'm, I need to cool off. Uh-huh. Like, I'm getting heated over this. But then the one thing that I can say with us is even though we get heated and even though we argue, um, it's never been insulting anybody. It's always, you know, even though we're friends, right? And that, that becomes easy as a friend. Like, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. being an idiot. Yeah. Like, it's never come to that. It's it's always been, this is the business. Yeah. We have to talk about it this way. And I think your idea is stupid. You're not stupid. The idea is stupid. But then we talk about, uh, and right now, it's when it comes down to decisions at this point, it's mostly me and Ross that argue. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of, Dennis has kind of stepped in and said, hey, guys, like, you're at this end, you're at this end. Why don't we meet somewhere in the middle and make something happen? And, and that's been huge, right? Having that third person, that third voice. And we, we've all said this, this company would not be what it is if it wasn't for all of us. Like if I was run, the only one running the company, it wouldn't be what it is today. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be as good as it is. If it wasn't for Ross and Dennis counterbalancing and pushing back and saying, nope, that's a dumb idea. Like, yeah, you know, we might cons- we might all make a dumb idea together. We might all go into something and say, yeah, we're good. Yeah. But we also have majority rules, period. Um, so if the majority vote happens, we're doing it. 
uh, and it makes decisions go very quickly. Um, now we always hear out everybody's opinions and thoughts and we take those into concern. And like, there have been points where I said, Hey, we're going to, like, I want to do this. And Dennis said, I agree. And Ross said, I don't agree because of X, Y, and Z. That is enough for us to go back and say, okay, well, hold on. Maybe we can amend what it is that we want to do. And because you thought of something that I didn't. Yeah. Right. And so we, we take all of that. Uh, and I don't want to say we don't, we don't take it with a grain of salt. Like it is very important to us that we have that input um, to make sure that we're not missing something, right? And we we love devil's advocate, right? And we love thinking worst case scenario because that's what when when you know when shit hits the fan, yeah, you have to be prepared for it. Yeah, have <clears throat> huh? Okay. And when you're like, have you guys noticed any any weird like has it has it affected your friendship outside of the company at all like are you guys all still as close outside of it or are you closer outside of the business we're closer now? outside of it okay um like we just check in on each other make sure everybody's okay which we did before but not like it yeah. is now and um you know there, there's a level of understanding of we all have two jobs right we're doing this yeah. um so there's a little more leniency with each other saying you know hey you you know you missed this or you didn't pay attention or you, you know, whatever, like we're not holding it against you. Uh, just letting you know, like, Hey, can you try to do something in the better? Um, and, and, you know, our wives again are very supportive. They have to be right. They don't have a choice really <laughs> yeah. in this aspect, and, and, but they can also make our life miserable. And, and we haven't had that, which is awesome. Um, That's good. and they also, um, when it comes to a decision, like there are sounding boards. Like I go home and I tell my wife yeah. what we're thinking about and she'll tell me that's a stupid idea. Hmm. Right. And then, so it's like, Hey guys, like Ashley said this and what do we think about that? Um, even though like our wives technically have no stake in the company. Yeah. Right. Like we, they're still our spouses and we still listen to them. And yeah. you know, like it's, it's not, Oh, you aren't part of this. We don't care. And when I've seen that with some businesses, right? Yeah. Like, I'm the owner. I do what I want to do and you have no say. Like, I want to know what my wife has to say about it. Yeah. Um, because I trust her, you know? Yeah. And we're all the same way. Huh. So it's 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 not like there's just three owners. There's there's more yeah. six owners. And we all have friends that we talk to. And your friends are like, oh, why don't you do this? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, you know, it's, it's a novel idea in some aspects where it's like, oh, well, you know, we thought about that. And this is why we didn't do it. But we can revisit. Yeah. Right? Because just because and we, we always have to say, right, a no is not a no forever. It's a no for right now. Yeah. Huh. Well, it seems like, like there's so many ways that the, that many people could go poorly. Oh yeah. And, but I think it, like the communication that you guys have, if that's not there, you're, we communicate, yeah, I mean, daily. you're in, and, and I'm an over communicator and they'll tell you that. Well, like good. I drive them insane yeah. because I'm like, you know, Hey guys, I thought about this. I thought about this. I thought about this. Yeah. And, you know, we, we get excited over different things. Um, and like, we don't have. We, we have titles because we legally have to, yeah. right? We don't fall under those titles, right? And we don't have designated responsibilities. It's, we need to, right? And that's something we've talked about is, you know, we need, uh, so typically from my perspective, right? I handle the social media 99.9% of the time. I handle the garden 99.9% of the time. I schedule the cooks. Um, Ross does more of the process stuff. And he's more of, um, we, we all contribute when it comes to designing a new sauce. Uh, Ross does a lot of the legwork for getting the, getting the stuff pH tested or um, ordering our labels, ordering our uh, stickers. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis does a lot of drop-off stuff where, hey, can you go take this? Um, I do the majority of the packaging for shipping out orders. We all kind of like have our segregated things and we need to probably – uh, deviate them up a little bit more so that we we have a, a kind of a shared load. Yeah. And we have, but like, there's nothing that I can do that I do that they don't know how to do. Yeah. Right. And, and like, we have like Ross for labels. I don't know our login, but he, all I have to do is text him and say, hey, Ross, what's the label login? Yeah. And he's going to give it to me. And so I can go and order what we need. Yeah. Right. And that's all save this templates, but it's like, we all have the same contacts when it comes to getting wholesale contracts in place. Like, we're all reaching out. We're all doing our own thing. We're making sure we're not talking to the same company. Um, new sauce ideas. It's it's a joint effort, right? Like I'll come in through and say, hey, I have this sauce idea. And Ross like, oh, I was working on something like that too. So we'll each make one, figure out what we like. You know, 
which one is better, uh-huh. right, and, or what we like about each one and try to combine those. And we've had a lot of sauces like that. Or we've had sauces that are very much one person with feedback from, like, I make the base and then we all kind of yeah. build into it. Okay. So it's, it's a very, uh, very much a team effort all the time, nonstop. Is the plan to, like, do you guys want to make it full-time? I would love to make it full-time. And if it wasn't for the fact that my benefits from my normal job... I would make it full time because at that point, going back to when I talked about the college, right? When my parents stopped paying for my my student loans, yeah. right? I'm accountable. If I leave and I do this full time, I'm accountable and mm-hmm. I can't fail because my yeah. family's relying on it. Yeah. Right? It's not just me. It's not just, yeah. oh, like I have a wife and a daughter. Yeah. And like she has activities and we need our house. And, you know, like yeah. there, there's no. Yeah. No room for failure. And we treat it like that now. Like, there, there's maybe a little more wiggle room. Like, oh, we made a mistake or we made a blunder or whatever. But, yeah. like, we're also um, – we, we've done it from that perspective. And we, we don't want it to fail. But we can also – oh, we're out of sauce this week? Okay. Yeah. Like, we'll cook it next week. And we've we had that happen a couple times. So, so you would – does everybody want it to be – yeah. Okay. Yeah. And are you trying to – like, are you working – or is it like a we want to do this, but we're not really sure how to get there? Mm-hmm. Or, like, we're actively we're trying actively to get there? We're actively trying. Okay. It's um, – COVID set us back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, COVID Especially was if a, events are your big it, thing. It was, a, it was a blessing in disguise um, in some ways, right? So we went into it. We had scheduled a bunch of events. And we came up with the fact that we were going to sell one bottle to 1% of the population that was at that event, right? So if it's a 300-person event, we're selling three bottles. That is not how the numbers worked, right? So we did our first farmer's market, and we sold out almost entirely in the first two hours. And it was a four-hour farmer's market. Thankfully, it rained and it shut us down, but we were like, oh, huh. oh boy. <laughs> like, this is not the numbers we were looking yeah, at, right? Yeah. Like, we, this went way better. Yeah. And now that the word has gotten out more, um, it's even more so. The the issue comes in is we need that continued revenue stream where right now we make 98% of our total yearly money in the last quarter of the year. Oh, wow. Okay. So because like <laughs> okay. last week, this past weekend – kicked off our festivals. So you had Oktoberfest, uh-huh. and then we did Cover Bridge Festival this year for the first time ever. Um, and then this weekend, we have Cecil Fall Festival. We did that for the first time last year. We did all our festivals for the first time last year. And then last year, we had a break. This year, we have Hickory Apple Festival. And then the following week, we have Houston Pumpkin Festival. So we have five events in a four-weekend time slot. So I ran Oktoberfest. Ross ran Cover Bridge. Dennis covered mostly most of the Cover Bridge, but he came to help me at one point for Oktoberfest. Right? He was kind of a floater. And we've started making sure that only two of us are at each event yeah. at most because it's all you need. And we don't want – one person can run it. It makes it hard if you have to go to the bathroom, if yeah. you want to go get food, if you want to yeah. get a drink, right? I can't just leave my table unattended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't want to right? because yeah. um, you don't want to lose a sale. Yeah. But at the same point, like then we have – we have a big break, which there are other events we could put in there. We just – we need to cook because we run a big sale in December. Then we have a Christmas festival in December, and we have – we do still CityCon. Well, that's, here. that's where it feels like that co-packer could – like if if that works, if that works, and you can cut out some of your cooking, like that feels – like those times when you're spending a, a weekend doing that, yeah. it feels like that's, that's the way to – only if you're already having them do right. stuff. Right, and the, the, the other thing is, too, is like, okay, so when we talk a co-packer, um, they're— Now, you're, you're obviously, like you said, the, the costs are, the cost are higher. There, right, so, yeah, for sure. Now, there, there's some—there's obvious uh, benefits, and there's, there's downfall, right? Downfall is funds, right? It's capital. Mm, um, yeah, 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 the cap, upfront cost for that, upfront yeah. They upfront cost, yeah, right? that's true. So, when we look at our numbers, uh, when we cook, we cook 20 gallons at a time. Up, maybe up to 30. Uh, and that's enough to last us for a few weeks. Okay. Because we have so many sauces, right? Yeah. And when you, when you only make one sauce or two sauces, that makes you far less time, right? If you're selling the same quantity we are, the, it's, it's much harder to keep up, right? You have to keep cu- cooking those mm. sauces over and over and over and over again, right? But because we have 10 sauces, sometimes 11, sometimes 12, depending on what's out, right? You're not – people aren't buying – the you know this one sauce consistently yeah right you might get 
you know, that might be 20% of your sales for a weekend, right? Or it could be 8% of your sales for a weekend. It's not going to be at least 50% of your sales for a weekend. So it becomes a little bit different. And when you're talking quantity, they're cooking anywhere from 80 to 100 to 400 gallons, right? So we're talking, we're cooking okay. 20 gallons. Yeah, their yeah, their yeah, base yeah. number is four times our amount. And there's three different models. There's you pay for the time. Uh-huh. There's you pay by the bottle. Or there is you pay a definitive upfront cost of X amount, right? So when you look at by the bottle, if you're making 100 gallons, that's like almost 3,000 bottles. And they're typically charging you a dollar to a dollar fifty per bottle yeah, just so, to manufacture. Yeah. Right. So we now have to spend bare minimum three thousand yeah, dollars just to get the sauce made. Yeah. Right. And that 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 hits our margins. Yeah. Dramatically. Right. Like that's a big upfront cost. Other benefits are right. They make it. We sh- we call them. We say, hey, we're shipping everything up. We make a couple phone calls. We source everything to them. They bottle it, they cap it, they seal it, they label it, it's done. Yeah. Right? Where we cook it, we load it into the car, we bring it home, or put in a, you know, we put it in a temperature controlled area, it sits, we let it cool down, because we're we're bottling it, you know, two hundred to two hundred and twenty degrees. Huh. So it has to cool down. And then because if you try to label that at two hundred degrees, uh-huh. the label's gonna the, the adhesive just gonna melt. Yeah. Right. Um so we, we don't label or seal for a day or two after everything is done. Um, but because it's, still, it's shelf-stable, we can sit there for six months before we label it. Yeah. Right? We know what it is. We know the batch number. We put the codes on the side. So we know exactly what it is that we did. Um, there's no question. Um, so we know that sauce is safe. We, we pH test every batch. And yeah. We, but, yeah, it comes down to it's the capital. The time investment isn't there, which is nice. But – the three hours that we're spending making sauce is not worth $3,000. Yeah. yeah and because we don't need it that often. Yeah. Right now, if we start needing 3,000 bottles of taco sauce every month, now we have yeah. a bigger discussion. So how are you guys approaching – like how are you currently trying to get to that point? What Do you have steps for that? Like, yeah, uh, like where yeah. are you guys – how are you so approaching that? More wholesale, number one, right? We, we want wholesale – because that's a continuous revenue stream. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not continuous from the fact of like we're getting the same, we're getting an order from the same company every week. Yeah. Right. But when you start supplementing that with you, I have, hey, these 20 places order once a month and they order like three cases. Well, you know, you're selling 60 cases mm-hmm. each month. Right. How are you getting, how are you approaching? Right wholesale? now, it's been a lot of cold calls. Okay. Um, people that hear us and they want to work with us, we've had a lot of that. Um, they see other places carrying us, like, hey, we want to work with these guys. Um, we, we have a good reputation. We've worked very hard on keeping that good reputation. Um, Do you, you ever know, just send people bottles, like decision makers? We have. When we go in and we want to talk to somebody, we take them bottles, and they're theirs to keep, right? So, like, we went into a – to um, Western Edge Seafood. We just we just announced that we started with them about a month ago. They just opened up their Cannonsburg shop, and that's when they wanted to bring us in. We've been working with them for over a year. Okay, that has been a year deal in the works. And it was, they were expanding, and they were expanding very, very rapidly, and they needed the manpower to go elsewhere. So we weren't their focus, which is yeah, fine. Yeah. We weren't going anywhere. They weren't going anywhere. I'd rather work with them after they've expanded than try yeah. to keep up with them during expansion. Yeah. Right? So we know what we're going to walk into. So we I, we had talked, and uh, I, I met them at one of the festivals. We do a lot, net, a lot of networking at festivals and events. Um, and so we scheduled a time and said, hey, we're going to come into your headquarters, which is down in Taylorstown, and we're going to bring sauces. We want you guys to try them. They said, cool, we're going to cook seafood empanadas. We're going to all have lunch. Okay? Cool. We sat down. They brought the whole staff in. So we met from everyone from the president down to the, the just your average worker, right? We all sat in the room. We all had lunch. They tried – every single one of them tried every one of our sauces. Every single one of them loved the sauces. <laughs> and at that point, it was – they were like, give us time. We will get this done. We will make this – we'll make, we'll make this yeah. happen. And they were like, we have expansion ideas after this too, so be ready. Great, let's go. Um, 
So it's been a lot of work. And then COVID came into play, right? Company shut down. Mm-hmm. We were going to work with Cannon's Chop House in South Point. That was going to be a great location for us. They didn't make it through the pandemic. You have other companies that they saw a big downfall in their business because of the pandemic. Um, or they saw staff shortages. Yeah. Um, and so they've pulled back, you know, from, yeah, we want to work with you too. We don't have the capital to do this because we have to put our capital towards man hours. Yeah. When you're, when you guys are looking at wholesale, are you, is this at like wholesale bottle sales or is there, like you mentioned Canon. So like, is, are you also approaching restaurants and things like that to be a sauce provider? It's all bottles. Okay. Um, we do some gallons for certain places. Um, it, it's hard to find gallon jugs that have to be glass, right? Because um, we can't we can't bottle plastic. If we bottle two hundred twenty degrees in plastic, it's going to just melt. Yeah. Um, so it has to be glass, and so we we have them. We found them, and we have some ideas coming up in the future. Uh, so we have some really cool things that we're going to be trying, and whether they work or not, whatever. Um, so, but it is working with restaurants. It's working with. Uh, wineries, it's working with stores. We haven't done any big box stores yet. Like, we, we're not approaching I, when I say big box store, I'm even thinking like Shop and Save, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they're not huge. Yeah. Like they're local. But we haven't approached them yet. Or Giant Eagle. We've been, we, we already have the contact with Marketplace. They want to work with us. We just need to sit down and get it done. Yeah. Um, but it's trying to find we when we do uh, wholesale, we really look at who we want to do business with. And there are companies that we have talked to that want to do business. We say, no, um, you're very polarizing. You like, we don't want anybody that's outspoken on politics or religion or race or anything like that. Right. Like we, we are Switzerland. We, yeah, yeah. we're neutral. We're business. Yeah. Our, our politics and our thought processes shouldn't matter. Yeah. Right. And unfortunately nowadays it does, but that's not the image that we it doesn't want. have to. Yeah. That's not the image we want. Right. And, if we go with somebody that's, you know, full blown one direction, that might turn off a bunch of other customers that are the other direction. Yeah. We would rather lose the couple customers that are going to be, you know, oh, well, you're not working with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's way less likely. It, it's far less. Yeah. We, we, we appeal to more people. Um, and so we're very, uh, we watch that demographic very closely. And because if you're selling our product, you're also representing us. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that the people we're working with, Put us in a good light. Do you have a like a standardized way of of looking at that, or is it more of like a feel thing it's a from all feel. of you? Okay, it's it's a we sit down and talk with you, and if you rub us the wrong way, then we we just you know it's usually it's not ever just one conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean unless you know you really rub us the wrong way, yeah, because people have off days. Yeah, it could be us, it could be you, right? It could be both ways. Yeah. Um, and it, it, well, and sometimes is, you don't like you just don't vibe with a person, and, and it's not it's not a that doesn't mean it's not somebody you want to go in business right. with. It's just like, it's like okay, we don't really like I don't want to hang out with you, but I trust you as a yeah, like you, those your are different. Business is good. Yeah, you don't do anything that makes us worry, right? We want to work with you. Yeah, and honestly, we've we've honestly vibe with everybody that we've worked with. Mm-hmm. It's been a great great experience. We've made great friends out of this. Um, Knowing so many of the local businesses now getting calls from, hey, we're going to do this. Do you want to be part of this? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and it goes into, uh, I, I know this this conversation really spurred from a comment that I made on Facebook that, um, you know, not every customer is right for us. Yeah. And we're not the right product for everybody else. Yeah. And there's a, a learning path to get into that mindset. And it's a hard How mindset to How did you guys to. get there? And, uh, well, Actually, are all of you that at that point, and what did it take to get there? One hundred percent, all at that point. Okay. Um, it was we we went to a place they didn't like our sauce, right? They very judgmental over it, and a couple of the guys got really upset over this. Like it, food is so weird, it though. Bothered them, yeah. Right? Like it, the owner was like, "Oh, well, you just do this. That's not it at all. Like you weren't even on the same flavor profile as what we did, right? Yeah. Like they saw a red sauce and they said, "Oh, it's just tomatoes." It's, there's no tomatoes in the sauce, right? Like that's <laughs> yeah. not even an ingredient that we use, right? Yeah. Um, just those very heavy judgmental uh-huh. upfront pieces. Um, and we, we become friends with this person. Like we, we do business with them now. Like yeah. it's, it, the tide turned, but there was um, – feelings were hurt, right? Because we have pride in our product. And this yeah. is the first time – the first time we've been told, I don't like it, right? That's a, that's a hard thing uh-huh. to hear. When you've put 
so much effort than we've is what we have any business owner does, right? Yeah. And you put something out there, and they're just like, "Yeah, I don't like it." Like, that's crushing. Yeah. And it's just like, I was like, "Well, guys, we're not gonna like everybody. Like, not everybody's like, I don't like other yeah, especially people's stuff. with food. It's yeah, like food is a whole different thing, right? Everyone ta- like everyone. A, they're probably tasting things differently, right. and. Their preferences are. You didn't it, used to like hot stuff. Exactly. Like, so like it's <laughs> like if you would have fed yourself those your sauces ten years, ten years ago, I wouldn't have liked them. Yeah, it's like, like I like, wouldn't have liked this shit. Them, right? Yeah. So like we we've gone through this this thought process and is is this is understanding that we're not the right. You know, we just that person might not be the right customer for us. Yeah. And we we sat down. We had a conversation about because like it took the one guy down. He was like, man, he's like, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Like, I don't think it's worth it. Like, yeah. We just got told no. <laughs> Negative comments suck. And it was, it was our first place that we had tried to approach. And they were like, no, we don't like it. And we're like, <laughs> I'm sitting going like, he had not done any other events up to this point where other, like, Dennis and I had. And so we were like, dude, you don't understand. Like, we've seen the feedback from the general population. Yeah. One person's opinion doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? Um. We, we, we've seen fe- farmer's markets where people are really excited to come over and see us. We've had – I tell this story, and I, I'm not – I want to preface I'm not being facetious in any way, shape, or form about how this occurred, okay? The most awkward customer interaction we have ever had to date, and it has happened twice. So the one time Dennis and I were at a farmer's market, and we see this woman come running from a building screaming, maestros. Maestro's getting our attention. She's across the street. We're on the other side of the farmer's market. She's screaming at us, <laughs> waiting. I need three bottles of this. Okay, whatever. What's the rush? She <laughs> runs over. Literally, we're, okay, we get it back. She throws a $20 bill out, throw, bottles it up and throws it at us, grabs a bag and runs back the other direction. And I'm going, what? just happened okay like we were just accosted for hot sauce like what you know we find out she was in between she works at a nail salon she was in between clients and she that was her only chance to come get hot sauce and instead of just like calling us and having us like Uh you know bring it over to her afterwards no this was her like i need to get the sauce right now and so we we told the guys the story that justin and ross and they're going bull like that didn't happen so we're all at a festival, and it happened again with a different person. And they were just like, they just sort of looked at us and Dennis and I were like, yep, told you. <laughs> like, it occurs. And it's, it's a weird feeling when you have – it's that has been the best thing about this where it has been um, – you get to see something you've put so much pride in. People enjoy it so much. Yeah. And that's the, the opposite out of the coin, right, where you have somebody that doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. And I can say we have had – I can think of three encounters, three total, out of, what, three years of operation, over three years of operation. Three encounters where somebody said, I don't like your product. And it's just, it's such a small thing, but, like, those negatives. They feel like they the worst. They quickly outweigh the positive. Yeah. And you have to go back, and it, yeah. it takes some reflection, yeah. right, uh, of saying, well, that's one person's opinion. We just sold, you know, 400 bottles this weekend and one person didn't yeah. like it. Like That's tough to get to. Though. I know when Trav and I were making the uh, the home slice videos, I mean, dude, we would get the worst comments. And oh, it was yeah. like a lot of positive, a lot of positive, a lot of positive. And but then someone would negative. give us a shitty comment. And every time I would screenshot it to Travis and then type out my shitty response and say, all right, man, like – all right, I'm not going to send this, but this is what I want to send. <laughs> right, and it's, it's it's hard, but when you look at how little it happens, yeah, and you have to make him like, oh, I saw your product here, and I'm really disappointed in it. And we're just like, who who are you? Like, or, I'm sorry, are you some critic? Are you yeah. some like? Yeah. No, no, you're you're just an average Joe schmo that yeah. doesn't like our product, and that's fine. Like, yeah. you don't have to. Like, if you're looking if for something, everybody liked your product, you couldn't fill, fulfill the need. That's the issue, right? Like, um, and the the other part of it is too is like, and we've had people. Well, your sauce isn't spicy enough. Like, I want something hotter. Okay, we we're very upfront. We are not trying to be the hottest sauce out yeah. there. We're trying to be the best tasting, right? We want it to be spicy, but anybody can make. And we've said this. I've said this. On TV, I've said this in the newspaper, like, I've said this on the radio. Yeah. Anybody can make a super hot hot sauce. It is not challenging. If you're trying to put X amount of peppers into a bottle, go for it. There are people out there for you 
that want to buy that. Yeah. We are not looking for that demographic, right? And we've had people that say, I want super spicy. We hand them our spiciest. They say, this isn't hot at all, but it tastes amazing. I will buy a bottle. And that's where you look at this demographic. Spice is not everything, right? They, they, they acknowledge that you've done something very different. Yeah. And that's cool, right? Um, and we, we, we have people, well, this isn't spicy. Well, here, let us give you some recommendations about other sauces that we know of and have had that are spicy, right? If that's what you're looking for, if you're looking to burn yourself the next morning, yeah. you know, you want to hurt while you're crying on the toilet, like, we can give you those recommendations. Yeah. We've been there. We've done it. We've yeah. tasted it. We're not trying to be that. And additionally, we have other sauces that are in the same lane as us. They are super flavorful. They're not always very spicy. And we'll recommend them right off the bat to other people as well. Like, that's the coolest thing about this is it's it's that community aspect. Yeah. Um, and that's where you, you don't need every customer to be your customer, right? Like, Well, I think that just beca- that comes from just being clear, like being clear about what you're trying it, to it's accomplish. Knowing who we are, yeah. right? Knowing what we're striving to be and not trying to be something we're not. Yeah. Right? And was that there from the beginning? Yes. Okay. That was that was that was our foundation, okay. right? Like that was literally our foundation of this is who we are, this is what we do, and nothing and we, we we get people, well, can you make this? Sure, we can make that. Are we going to? Absolutely not. Yeah. Because it's not worth our time and effort yeah. to do that, right? Like why would we make a novelty sauce? We we want to buy something. We want to make something that you're going to eat it and come back and want to buy more. Not, oh, this was really hot and it hurt, right? And yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm on to the next hot thing. Like, we want to leave something with you that that was one of the most delicious sauces I've ever had, and I can't eat a meal without it. Yeah. And we've we've accomplished that to some degree, right? Like, yeah. obviously, we're, like, we're, not, we're not some massive corporation, right? Yeah. But, like, we've had a customer that messaged us on a, a, a Wednesday night or a Thursday night and said, hey, I know you're going to be in Monroeville or like I, I need to get taco sauce from you. And we said to him like, <laughs> well, we leave from Monroeville. It's 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Like, and we won't be home until he's like, well, I have tacos for dinner tomorrow. <laughs> I need this sauce. And our option was meet us at Sheets at 6.30 in the morning. And we'll bring, he's like, done. And he literally was there at 6 or in the morning. He could not, like, there was no other option for him. Like, he, I was like, there's, he's like, no, I don't want to support, I don't want to buy it from another store. I want to buy it from you guys. All right, man, meet us at Sheets at 6 30. We'll get coffee and we'll give you your sauce. Like, I guess that's what we're going to do. And, you know, he made the comment, he's like, taco night's not taco night without my stress. And I'm like, there's a catchphrase, that's, I guess. Yeah, like, I that's mean, cool. But, that's but pretty it was, cool. It was, we've had that interaction with so many different customers that they, they, I need this. I'm like, you don't need this. Like, it's yeah. not, your life it's is going to end if you don't yeah. get it, right? <laughs> yeah. like, but, like, it's, it's, it's a cool sentiment from our perspective that yeah. they really want that much. They want their yeah. product that bad. When, when you guys, like, how many sauces, how many did you start with? How many, yeah. We started with one. Okay. We started with our Curry Fury. That was the one that kicked us off. And then we quickly moved into, I would say about a month later, we brought up Mo Honey. And again, we weren't selling these, right? Yeah. These were... Well, so when you started to sell, how many did you have? We started to sell, we had three. Okay. No. Four. We had four. We had a fifth one that was being tested. So we had... Um, we had curry, mo honey, roasted ghosted garlic, and taco. We were testing the Maruga Triangle. I had just made that one, that pineapple mango sauce, and people... We, we got a lot of really good response to it. And then we made roasted garlic. And that came from, that came shortly after, and that came from listening to our customers, where we had people that said, hey, I love roasted ghost of garlic, but it's too hot for me. I want that flavor, but not that heat. And we had so, it was repetitive, uh-huh. like a constant thing. This is one of those decisions that caused an argument with the company and within, within the four of us, and it was three versus one. Okay, and and I'll I'll mention Ross's name. He was the one outsider, and he'll admit it to this day. He admits that he was wrong. Okay, um, he doesn't shy away from it. He made a mistake. What was the argument? The argument was so I said, okay, we have roasted ghosted garlic. We have an amazing, incredible sauce right here. Like that is our flagship sauce. If you were to say like, what is your sauce? Like that's it, yeah. right? 
So in that sauce, we use dried ghost peppers. We do that because we didn't want the flavor. We wanted just the heat. We don't use a lot of them, just enough to give it that kick, yeah. right? So that is a flavor, that is a piece of it that does not attribute to anything else to that sauce except for heat. We pull that out. We don't use it. We just omit mm-hmm. an, in- an ingredient. We know the sauce is still shelf-stable. We know it's still safe. We know it tastes exactly the way that it's supposed to. It's just not spicy anymore. Let's do that. Ross said, no, I think we should make our, I think we should make a brand new sauce. It's like, dude. Okay. We have this. He's like, I don't I get that. He's like, I want to make something that's, I don't want to make the same thing over again. Yeah. Which I understood. Yeah. I said, but listen, the customer saying, I want this sauce, mm-hmm. just not as spicy. They don't want something different, less spicy. They want this less spicy. Yeah. Right. So they're telling us, they're telling us what they want and we can make it happen with just an omission of one ingredient. Yeah. Which, by the way... Do you reduces, have to get that retested? Yeah. Okay. Which, you that know, sucks. by the way, reduces our cost. Yeah. Like, it now costs us less money to make that sauce because ghost peppers are expensive. Was there a thought of repl- or just replacing the the hotter version with the new version? No. Or was there an... No, okay, so there was... We had, a, it was such a split camp. Okay, okay. Where we, we had... I mean, when I say this, I had hundreds of people that said, I want the milder version. Yeah. They were still buying the hot version. They weren't using very much of it, yeah. right? Um, but they said, if you buy this, we're going to buy a lot of it. Cool. So we did. And so we took it out. And so it's weird. Like, our numbers have changed over the years. So last year, Roasted Garlic was our number one bestseller by two to one. Wow. We sold twice as much of that as we did Roasted Ghosted Garlic. And Roasted Ghosted was heads in, a, heads in like, a way above everything else. Huh. This year... We had a huge stockpile of roasted garlic going into this year. We cooked a ton of it over the winter time. We and we're talking like we designated like four solid cooks directly to that sauce. Damn. And it fell off the wagon. Like people were still in it. They're I don't want to say like it's not it's not something. It's yeah, we, it's just not make, two to one. Yeah. Make, yeah. Roasted ghosted garlic became the two to one seller this year. Huh. So we try to plan and prep and, and you know get ready for it, and you never know. Yeah. Right? Like we know what our lower sellers are, we know what our higher sellers are, and we know that we have to cook these sauces. And we, we just kind of broke it to this point. Like, we know we have to cook these sauces at least two times fast, more often than these sauces. Yeah. This one we might have to cook three times more, right? Um, and we, hmm. we try to, do, like, my, my normal job is I'm, I'm an analyst, right? Yeah. Like, well, I'm a, I'm a data manager, but I do analytics all day. Like, that's my job. Yeah. So I analyze all of our sales numbers, and I analyze our growth, and I analyze, I, you know, I trend out everything. So we have this information, right? Um which is awesome. We don't have to pay somebody else to do that. Right? Yeah, I can yeah, do that. Yeah. Um, and so it, we all get to use our real life skill or our work skills, our normal work skills yeah. for this. So I do that. Ross does cybersecurity. Dennis does marketing. So we get to incorporate all these different attributes into this. What uh, Whatever happened to your cranberry? It's still sitting there. Um, it's potentially going to make a return. <laughs> um, not this year. Definitely not this year, but uh, hopefully next year. So what we've kind of been talking about. That sounds int- I'm a massive fan of like cranberry sauce and a spicy version of that. Yeah, it's That sounds it's pretty, pretty banging. Good. And like we need to refine it. Yeah. It needs, it needs some uh, twe- tweaks to it because it was a very rough, yeah. you know, rough and batch. And that's been the kind of the cool part is like we, um, we get to be super creative. And it was a huge outlet during COVID where you can't do anything else. Uh-huh. And I can sit there and like. Think of new sauces and then go out and spend 15 bucks and flush, you know, just flush them out and see, yeah. like, oh, how'd this come out? Yeah. And, like, we have we have one that we're supposed to bring out for the Whiskey Rebellion. We haven't been into that event yet. And we have to figure out how to do it because um, alcohol is in it, but we have to be under a certain ABV, which this is, goes into that community kind of story again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we made our, our Maruga Triangle originally had rum in it. And we got a message from another local hot saucer, uh, Tom from Allegheny City Farms, who is the biggest manufacturer in the area. And he said, hey, man, just to let you know, you have to get that ABV tested because you have alcohol in it. He said, you have to be under 0.5%. And I was like, okay. He didn't have to say that. Yeah. Right? We could have been blindsided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, he could just let us sit there and just like waffle uh-huh. around, right? We could have been cool. fine, shut down, whatever. Had to pay, you know, to the, the alcohol, you know, mm-hmm. commission, whatever. Like, he didn't do that, though. He reached out and said, hey, you need to do this. That's cool. So we had it tested. So we had to be 0.5% ABV. We were at 1.75%. Okay. 
we were like, okay, well, <laughs> so we did the math and said, okay, well, we have to take away this much alcohol. And at that point, it wasn't worth putting it in. Mm-hmm. So we have another one that uses a rye whiskey um, that we have to figure out how to get the alcohol. So I'm, I need to figure out if I, if I flambe it and, and burn off all that alcohol, if that's going to help. Because cooking it only takes out so much. Yeah. This sauce is absolutely stellar. Uh, I made a couple test batches, and friends and family got some. They're like, that is incredible. We have a, a blackberry sauce that we tried. Um, it's also really good. Uh, we have that cranberry sauce that we're sitting on. Um, we have that serrano sauce that we've gone back and tinkered with. We have uh, a very smoky, almost like a steak sauce kind of sauce. Okay. Um, that we we made it. And we pulled it from production because it didn't meet our standards. It wasn't as good as we thought it could be. So we just have to get back and design it again. Um, we're also looking at – we have a couple more barbecue sauce ideas. We're actually looking at sauces that don't have spice at all, just sauce. Mm-hmm. And it, we, we named ourselves Maestro Sauce Co. because we didn't want to be limited to just hot, hot sauces. Yeah. Um, we were looking at potentially doing dry rubs and you know, kind of like branching out in that mm-hmm. avenue as well. And there's a lot of opportunities for us. And uh, we're in conversations with doing some other non-hot sauces um, that fall under our certified foods. That's what we technically are. We have to do things with acidity. Um, That's what our licensing is in. That's what I went to. I had to do a 20-hour class at University of Georgia for a license for that, um, for better process controls and acidified foods and things like that. So those are all mandatory. Have you had anybody reach out? to? Can Well, first, actually, can you produce for other people yes have you done that or no okay have we had people ask yes we are approaching that very cautiously um so we did that originally with the barbecue sauce uh the butcher sauce was done in conjunction with heritage Cock butchers who they're not around anymore unfortunately yeah, yeah. um but we told them listen we're gonna make it your name is gonna be in the description but it's our sauce. Yeah. We get to sell it still. You can sell it. You can carry it. You're going to buy it from us. Yeah. You can use it in your recipes. But we, it's our sauce. We're still selling it. We've been approached by somebody else. And we're approaching this very differently. Like, they want it to be just theirs. And we're like, there's there, there's a couple of different avenues we have to figure out. Right now, we're Well, you end up com- becoming like the co-packer there. Essentially. Well, yeah. We would design it manufacture oh, well, okay it so you're designing it, it too yeah. okay oh wow um, okay and so they want us they want to use us for that and like that's fine but you have to make it worth our time yeah. to do that right because yeah, that's also we, taken away from you we've talked about that as a company uh and we're we're so far we're leaning no um there would there and i, I, I told them there have to be more conversations about this because there's there's time and effort development there is the we have to get it we have to get it approved by the process authority. We have to make sure that the everything is up to snuff with it. And then once we do all that, which can take months, right, for designing a sauce yeah. and getting everything said and done, now you have to make it worth all that time plus the time it takes yeah. for us to make it, right? You have to order quantities that make it worth our time. Yeah. How are, are any of you close to making the jump? To full time, and is that how is the like? How are the discussions around that? Like, is it something that all three of you need to do, or it's like it's how are be a one at a time? Um, and it's can we meet their salary and give them enough to pay for benefits on top of it? And the answer to that point is no so far. Um, so that's why nobody has made the jump. Um, if we had somebody that did make the jump, we could easily get there. But there's that risk, yeah. and they have to yeah. still be able to make their mortgage payment. They yeah. still have to be able to pay their car off. You know. Yeah. So it's – we'd rather – honestly, we'd probably hire somebody first. Okay. Instead of one of us go full-time. Yeah. I'd love to hi- – I'd love for one of us to go full-time or two of us to go full-time mm-hmm. and then hire people. That kind of works better. But it's it's so hard to do that where, you know, they're taking the risk. If we can't pay them, then yeah. we have to lay them off, and, and that's the situation that it is. Um, it, becomes, it becomes – Well, paying somebody else to do it too is way cheaper than – Than doing it ourselves. Yeah. Um, and seems like there's there, there's less risk involved there. Like if there, there's you know, more risk and less risk in different areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, um, are they going to do things in the same way that we did it? Yeah. Or, you know, that seems pretty relatively easy to mitigate, though. And, and my thing is, 
uh, when I look at an employee, I want to be able to, tr- my biggest factor isn't whether they know how to do this or how to do that. Yeah. They can be trained, right? I, I covered that earlier, right? Like we can train them to do things the way that we do them. Number one, do they, it, it, I'm, I'm never going to expect them to have the same drive yeah, that I, I do, mean, right? Yeah, you it's can't. not their business. Yeah. It, it's, it's my business. I'm going to, if I'm, if they're hungry, if they're as hungry as I am for it, then what am I doing? Yeah. Right. If I don't have the hunger more than they do, if I'm not willing to put in the more, more hours and more work and more time, then what am I doing? Right. If I'm letting somebody outwork me at my own company, then <laughs> yeah. there's a big problem. Um, so I can't expect them to have the same drive or the same hunger, um, or care as much as I do. Right. But do they care? To some degree, and can I trust them? Yeah. My biggest thing is, I need to be able to trust you because you represent me. It's all this representation. I keep going back to it over and over again, and that's really what we thrive on. We have a reputation. We have our product has a reputation. We have a reputation. Our company has a reputation, and they're all different. Yeah. Right. They all tie together, but they're all different. Um. So we need you to be part of that. We need you to tie in with that. And how are you going to do that? I don't care if you know how to bottle sauce. I'm going to teach you how to do that. Yeah. I don't care if you know how to pack a box. I'm going to teach you how to do that. Right? I, that doesn't matter to me. Right? You, you can, I can teach you that. That's a, that's a hard skill. That's mm-hmm. not a soft skill. Your soft skills are more important to me than your hard skills are. We didn't have the hard skills, right? We yeah. learned them. Yeah. Huh. So do you think, like, do you have an estimate, an estimate for, like, how many years or how, uh, probably measuring in years at this point? But It's, it's years. Um, we have had people help us. And I'm saying for either any of you jumping off or, fi- or finding somebody finding to actually. Finding time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's probably sooner rather than later. Um, we're hoping maybe by next year we have somebody. That's pretty cool. It's kind of nice. That's pretty cool. Um. We, we know that if we have somebody, and, and they don't, the thing is, like, it's not your regular nine to five, right? Like, yeah. you're going to be working some pretty odd hours. Yeah. You know, you might go and run a festival, like, from 10 to 7 or whatever. Like, you might put in your 40 hours mm-hmm. in three days, right? And, but you might have the rest of the week off. Yeah. Or you might work more. Yeah. It depends. Um it's not like you're doing it by yourself. Like, we're always yeah, yeah, going to be yeah. there side by side helping yeah. out. Um, but, like, we cook at nights. If we need you in the kitchen, you have to be available from 6.30 to 9.30. Yeah. You know, so you have to be flexible. But guess what? You don't have to do crap for us to write the day. Yeah. Right? You have to come in. You, you might have to come in and help us prep stuff. Yeah. Um, depending on what sauce we're making. And that, that's, that's really it. So it's like, you know, your schedule is going to be very ebb and flow. You have to be... You have to be relax with that piece. Um, now I'm never going to ask you to work 90 hours a week, right? Like, or even, even 60 hours a week, 50 hours a week. Like if we're putting you to work at 40 hours a week, that's, we're doing really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, do we, it, the thing is like, we have festival this weekend, right? I'm not going to be there both days. I'll be there one day, right? Like we're not, that's not how we're going to run this. So what it gives me the opportunity is, I might not have to be there this weekend. I might have to be there next weekend. But we're looking at it from that range, and we, we've kind of decided that we, we want to pay them $15 an hour. We don't want to pay them seven fifty or whatever the minimum yeah. wage is. Like yeah. we, you're going to be working. Like, and it's it's not like, you know, you're not out in the hot sun doing stuff. You're in a kitchen. You're, yeah. you're cooking, and you're carrying heavy things now back and forth. Not super heavy. We have carts and stuff like that. But, yeah. like... It's not nothing. It's it's not nothing, and it's ex- like being at an event all weekend. You're exhausted because yeah. you have to be on a hundred percent of the time, and that's the most draining thing in the world. Like, you are a salesperson. You have to be on. You don't yeah. get to take a break and not be yeah. the salesperson, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because if somebody sees you and you're walking around the festival and you're trying to get food and you you like you're grumpy with them, you just reflected us poorly. Mm-hmm. So it's a different type of experience where, like, oh, my job, if I'm having a bad day and I go to my cube and I, you know, just sit down or I go to my office and slam the door and don't talk to me for that, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, I'm in front of people. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, 
Okay, we've covered a lot, um, and we've crossed over two hours. Um, do you have? I feel like there's a lot still on the table here. <laughs> um, but it might be stuff to to come back to. Um, let me. Do you, is there anything that comes to mind that we didn't that we didn't touch on? Um, a lot of the things that I have here, the, my biggest questions were around the owners. Like, that seems, like, so difficult to manage. It, um, but having a good relationship and good communication, um, there are positives to that. Obviously, the negatives, if things go poorly, are now you're losing a friend, not right. just a... Not just um, a business partner. Yeah. And we've had, like... We, we've had our tough times, right, where we've, we've been mad at each other, and it's never gotten in the way of anything else. Yeah. It's always been a call the next day, like, hey, man, I'm really sorry, like, kind of flew off the handle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still don't like the idea, but I, I approached it poorly. Um, and that takes some reflection. That, yeah. that takes owning the fact that, like, I just acted like a dumbass, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. how do I fix that? Um, but it's being accepting of each other and understanding that we all don't have the answers, right? We're all trying to figure the same thing out, and yeah. it's complicated. Yeah. Um, so how do we... We're in it together, and it means as much to each of us as it does, you know, each yeah. one of us matters to it. Yeah. So. Um, anything else that we didn't that we didn't touch on that you think is important enough to, to hit? Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest parts are, you know, it, it can't be afraid of work. You can't be afraid of arguing and voicing your opinion, and you have to understand that. Respectfully. Respectfully. Yes. And, and you, you – Because another yeah. piece of that that I think can sometimes – like you – you don't – like your opinion isn't always right. No, absolutely not. So like not. you can approach it from like, yeah, I feel strongly about this opinion, but – it Unless you've that. got the research behind it and it's a fa- – like in, you're speaking in fact and it's right. like, you know, you're telling me this is brown, but I'm seeing this is clearly green. Right. It's like, okay, there's some things that are pretty clear. But when we're talking about like, oh, should we do this or should we do this? Dude, no, none of us know. Like we can't, we can't see what the future right. and, is. So as long as we're clear about this and our, know – Our big approach our, – our, so we, we've had a few things, right? Like – Quality is key. Flavor comes first, and try everything. Um, that's been one of our. That's been th- those are our three, our three pieces of our triangle, right? Like, um, and when I say try everything, it it varies from. I have a sauce idea. Try it, right? I think we should use this ingredient. Let's try it, right? It could be something that's mm-hmm. our our mojito bolognese. We tried cucumber there at first. It sucked. Okay, it tastes, <laughs> the whole sauce just tastes like spicy cucumbers, okay? Oh, Not good, okay? That doesn't sound great. But, like, we tried it. They didn't say no. When, when we made our hot chocolate sauce, when, when I designed that sauce, like, I was like, this is what I want to do. And they were just like, I don't like the idea, but go for it. <laughs> like, and they, it was enough where people were like, yeah, look, I'm going to buy that. And so we were like, all right, we'll make it. Yeah. And so we, we've – it's gone from that try anything to we don't know how this event's going to be. Let's try it. Right? Like, let's do this. Let's see what comes out of it. Right? Worst case scenario, we waste some time, we waste a little bit of money, but we learned we learned something. When you guys have a sauce that you all like, do you take – do you start – do you take it to market before – like, how do you test that? How do you decide when it's time to sell something? That's a good question. I was – yeah, so we um, we do a couple different things. So we have a uh, – people are always like, oh, do you use the – do you have the peppers in mind first or do you – like, no, we have a base. We want this flavor. Again, everything mm-hmm. is based off of flavor. Flavor yeah. is first, right? So we have this base profile and we say this is what we want. What – key components can we use what peppers can tie into this and if it, if it is something like i want a serrano sauce like i want it to taste like serranos okay that's the key component we mm-hmm. have that flavor profile right but when we looked at like roasted ghosted garlic the ghost pepper wasn't even part of that equation right it was roasted garlic yeah we wanted savory tones so it was like okay what goes well with that okay well shallots are going to probably go pretty well let's try those out and do we roast those as well how do we do this right and so we, you build out this this profile. You have a bunch of ideas. You try them all. And so the way we work it is we get that base profile and we cook it. No peppers, no spice, nothing, right? Base profile. And then we take that and we pour it into ramekins. And we say, okay, 
Let's taste it. Well, I think it needs a little bit more of this. I think it needs a little bit, and so we, it needs a little more salt. Do you have something that you guys like to taste what taste it with? Our fingers. Okay. Mm. Okay. That's it. Okay. Right? So, and we're at home. We're, we're we don't do test yeah, kitchens. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're not yeah. we're not cooking in the kitchen. Like yeah. it's it's our house. We can do whatever we want. Um, so we taste it. Sometimes it's a spoon. Sometimes yeah, yeah. mostly it's our fingers. Okay. Though. Um, when you start getting it, it's really hot out of the kettle. Then obviously you can't do that. Or if it's like super spicy, you're just like, I'm gonna use a spoon now. Yeah. Um, and so we make our profile. And it's like, okay, we need a little more salt. So we put some salt in. We measure out how much it is. Taste it again. Okay, that that tastes really good. Let's do it to the rest of the ramekins. And we kind of do this iterative process where, you know, we go until we find something we don't like, and then that that ramekin just goes away. And now we're stuck with this. Okay. So it's it's a add and take away. Mm-hmm. So we're not tainting everything else with it. Uh-huh. And then once we have that down more, okay, now let's cook a, another pot of it. We have this recipe. Let's make sure that everything carries over and go with that. And now let's see what the peppers do. These are the ideas we have. Let's put these in. These are the quantities we're looking at. And that's when you start tasting again and again. And so we've eaten every single one of our sauces at like 200 degrees, which is really miserable because of the way capsaicin works. <laughs> um and so, like, that part sucks, but we do this iterative approach, um, and that's how we we hone in where all of us have a say, right? Somebody might have the base idea. Now we all get to say the iterative. Do you take those two events before you start bottling and selling, or? Yes and no. Okay. Um, we've, we have and we haven't. We've taken them, uh, obviously, working at PBG generated you know, benefits where mm-hmm. I could take a bottle of sauce in or we could take a bottle of mm-hmm. sauce in and have. Yeah. 200 people try it, yeah. right? Like, hey, guys, we have new, and you just sent an IM. We come down at lunch. We're going to try the sauce. People, I mean, literally people just flock. Like, we're going to meet in this conference room. <laughs> we book it. And next thing you know, you have, like, 45 people standing in a conference room. Like, hey, where's the sauce at? All right, cool. Or we, like, recently, since we have been in the office, we cook a bottle up. I mean, we, we cook some up. We put some in some you know, some bottles, and we, we put it into a squeeze bottle, and we take it to events. And we say, hey. So Steel Hurton, when we made that one, it was called the Prototype. Um, the working name for it was the FU sauce, uh, because of how we came up with that sauce. But, um, it was, it's designed to be spicy. It's designed to hurt. Uh, that's, that's what we were going. We wanted to be flavorful at the same time. Uh We wanted you to be like, oh my God, it hurts so bad, but it tastes so good. I want to keep coming back for more. We took that to Sill City Con and we said, Hey, this is the bottle of the prototype. And then we took it to farmer's markets and we had other people try it there. We did the same thing with hot chocolate, right? Like people got to try it at festivals. Our customers got to try it and give us their feedback um, and, and let us know whether they liked it or not. And it's like, you know, basically if you're a customer of ours and you're already buying our sauces, it you tell us whether you're going to buy this one too or not. Yeah. If you're like, no, I'm not going to buy that. Okay. Let's see how many no's we get versus yeses. Yeah. And, and are you tracking those things or are you, is it more of like, oh, general sentiment felt positive? General. Okay, okay. Yeah, we, we don't have like a tally yeah. sheet of yes versus no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's Honestly, it's been so overwhelming of yes that we haven't had to do that. Um, okay. You know, very few no's of like, oh, I don't really like that flavor profile because with the, the steel heart specifically, right? It's heavy ginger. I don't really like ginger. No, you're probably not going to like the sauce. Yeah, then, yeah. Right? Like, I'm not, I'm not offended by that. Or, you know, the the devil dust where it's it's a heavy mustard base. I don't really like mustard all that much. Well, you're probably not going to like the sauce because yeah. it's a lot of mustard. Yeah. Um, and that's fine, right? Each person has their own taste. They yeah. have their own opinions and their own thoughts and goes back to, well, it's not the sauce for you. Yeah. Um, We've and got we others. We, we aren't trying to make uh, – the, the general thought at the beginning was like we want our sauce to go good on everything. It doesn't work, right? So we don't have one sauce that goes great on everything. We have a sauce – for everything. Yeah. Right? And we, we get people like, oh. Well, to make something that goes with everything it's is like, too hard. you're like going to end up with something that's just kind of bland. Exactly. And people are like, like you know, are you going to make a buffalo sauce? No. There's already 10,000 yeah. buffalo sauces out there. Why yeah. do we need, would, would ours be different? Would it be, yeah. Yeah. But is it worth our time and effort yeah. to do that? Right? And and would we, would we, would it sell? For sure. Right? Would we make money off it? Absolutely. But is it going to be worth the time investment to come up with a sauce, pay for it to get done, get labels, bottle it, label it, whatever, yeah. and then carry it to events and sell it, are we going to make enough money back off of it just because it's a buffalo sauce? And the answer is that's not who we are. We're not trying to be yeah. that. Well, unless you're coming up with something that's a little bit different that you guys are looking for. Right. You know, it's and like- we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to be unique. We're trying to be mm-hmm. something that's very different from what you normally find. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
Well, <laughs> this was a good one. <laughs> um, we got deep in the sauces. Deep in the sauces. <laughs> um, okay. Where can the humans of planet Earth find you um, and maestros and all of the things? What, uh, what should they be looking for? Uh, so right now, festivals is the best place to catch us. Um, so we have this weekend also, is... I don't know how soon this is going to come out. So okay. it's probably like uh, at least a couple weeks. A couple weeks? So. Okay. So um, festivals are happening now. If this is released at a later date, which it sounds like it's going to yeah. be, then you'll have missed those. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, next year we'll be there. Um, so we have a few things on in November, some smaller items, a barbecue that we're going to and uh, another like a like a home show kind of thing. Um, Christmas time, we have our online sale on our website. You can always find us at our website, uh, maestrosauceco.com. Um it's long and it sucks, and we didn't think about that when we thought about it. Yeah. Like, Link will be in it. the description. Yeah. Just click on that and thing. And then um, definitely follow us on Facebook or Instagram. We post everywhere we're going to be for that. You can come meet us in person. We're the only ones that, like, you. at least one of us owners will be at our stand every single time. Um, once in a while we do cater for some help mm. to run stands because somebody else is busy. Um, we have 20 locations that carry us. So... Um, if you're is that on your site? Some of it is. Some okay. of it needs to be updated. We're okay. working on getting our website redone. Um, we were trying to get a business loan, and that didn't come through all the way. So we we have we've been in the conversations to get it done. Um, some of it's there. I need to update it, and that's just that's on me. Yeah. Um, but I can update it. In fact, I, I plan on doing that hopefully this weekend. So by this point, yeah. it should be out. Um, a lot of local areas that have us, different restaurants. Um, if you think of anybody that would be good to carry us, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. We'll be happy to reach out to them. Um, we've had or, some – Or tell those places. Yeah, or uh, tell those places. We, yeah. we literally had a guy – we got a call from them. It was a bar in St. Louis. They do hot sauce and beer. They Their employee – put a post note on their desk and said, call Maestro Sosco, <laughs> get their sauces here. And so we we haven't done it with them because they want to order, like, cases. And we don't know how to ship, like, a half a pallet of cases over to St. Louis. We don't know how to do that yet. And that's a big part of what's holding us back, right? Because okay. if we could do that, like, if we knew how to do freight. what Like, what about that? Like the How to even start getting, like, how do we put things on? How do we get a pallet to put things on? How do we get it packaged? Who do we go through to ship it? How do we get it picked up? Um, basically, freight in general. We've never done that. We've all just done regular shipping. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, like the, the the lady that orders from us down in North Carolina, uh, it, just take we a just, trip. We just ship her. We just ship her a case. You know. Um, and so, like, that's how she's done it. But like, if she ever needs more than that, we have to figure it out. And just take a trip down to St. Louis. Rent a U-Haul, and I would love to. Honestly, <laughs> like. That'd be a that'd be a fun time, but like we have a couple places over in Latrobe, we drove to those. We have a couple places up in Altoona, we drive to those. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we have some some places like that. So the freight piece is something we're missing, and if you have any contacts about that, we would love to hear because um, we're, we're really trying to figure that piece out. For it, it's you know we're not going to get raked over the coals on on costs and shipping yeah. costs. I already understand, so yeah, yeah. But, um, we are. We actually just bought a cargo van, so that's that, we cool. don't have to rent the U-Haul anymore. That's pretty cool. So it's that's kind of be fun. Um, but yeah, we we have a lot of different locations to carry. Since a variety, right? It's it's wineries, mm-hmm. it's uh, restaurants, it's little mom and pop shops. Like it's kind of cool from that perspective. So we're always okay. looking for more. Okay. Uh, well, that those links will all be down in the description. Um, Check their sauces out. If you're at a, if you're local, find find a place that they're at. If not, we it's, do it uh, is. flat six dollar nationwide shipping. We only do the U.S. We have okay. not done any export stuff yet. We have people that have asked numerous times. We have fans up in sad. Canada. We have fans in Mexico. We have fans over in Europe, and we can't ship them anything. They've had them when they were here in the U.S. Yeah. Well, check them out if you're in the U.S. If you're not, then cross the border and come to an event. <laughs> <laughs> um, come to Pittsburgh. Um, Yeah, their stuff's great. Check them out. Uh, Links are in the description. Thanks for listening and watching or, or watching and share this with all your friends. 
or business owner friends or whatever. Uh, thanks. See you next time. I'm your host, Bradley Martin, and this is Clearing the Way, a resource for small business owners.